the Parent and Family Resource. Introduction to Partner Relationships and Parenting Eloisa discusses how partner relationship dynamics affect family dynamics and how unhealed emotional injuries in both parents are reflected by children in the family. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia on the 23rd of March 2021 at 9am. Hello and welcome to the Parenting Principles Program. I'm Eloisa. Today I want to discuss relationships, partner relationships in regards to parenting and talk a bit about the dynamics between partners and children. As a reminder, this is taking Teachings of Divine Truth as taught by my friends Jesus and Mary Magdalene, also known as AJ Miller and Mary Luck, taking principles of divine truth and applying them to parenting. So what I am speaking about is not new information, uh, the original source is from Jesus and Mary, and if you'd like to find out more information directly, I suggest to go to the divinetruth.com website, and they have links to YouTube channels and a lot of information. The Parenting Principles program is literally that, taking principles of divine truth, and then specifically talking about those principles in relation to parenting. Regardless of whether you're a parent or not yet, you could still apply these, parent, these principles to your own life. That's the beauty of principles. They cross over all areas of, of life. They're not situation specific. And that's why I feel they're so important to learn and understand is you can actually take the principle and apply it to anything that is happening in the family. I feel if parents make love-based changes, that there's a lot of wonderful on-flow effects that affect children in a positive way and actually create a much more harmonious, connected, close family relationships. I feel there's a lot of pain and suffering that happens in families in general. Most of us as adults have various feelings and uh, sometimes a lot of trauma actually from our family interactions as small children. Some of us are in a lot of denial about what happened to us as small children. But we have what, the way we are now is directly affected by what happened in our lives as small children, unless we've gone through a process of releasing those um, feelings and issues and errors and beliefs and whatever we've picked up along the way and then acted upon in our own lives. So this program, you can take any of the principles and you can apply them if you have children or you don't have children. I particularly use family-based examples, talk a lot about parents and children, as that's where I want to focus viewers on is the relationships um, in the family dynamic. If you are a parent or you've been in a family, I'm sure that there have been times where there's been conflict or people being quite unkind to each other, or also maybe you think, you know, sometimes it feels like everything's fantastic in your family, but we don't really know, sometimes I notice that we don't really know our other family members, not their true feelings or thoughts or what they really feel about situations. These presentations are to share the principles of divine truth and then if you would like to, you can experiment with that in your family and see how it goes. So in previous videos, I have spoken about a whole, um, quite a lot of different concepts and ideas from the teachings of divine truth and then applying them to different parenting situations. As I've been reflecting on the videos that I've already made, I've also realized how important it is the partner relationship or the relationships between the adults in the family. Now that might be uh, multiple adults. In a sense, you may have grandparents still living with you. You may have siblings, I'm not sure. You could have all different dynamics with the adults, but the adult relationships um, influence the, what's happening between the children and also the relationships between the adults and children in the family. So this video I want to focus mainly on partner relationships, so that's between you and your partner, whether that be um, husband and wife, or a wife and wife, or a husband and husband, or a man, so man, ma two males, two females, or a male and a female. Uh, these same principles can apply to any of these, any of the, any relationship. The principles also apply between sibling relationships, but the focus is going to be on partners, so a romantic relationship. In this presentation, I'll talk about 
four primary questions that you can ask yourself and your partner can ask themselves in a relationship. It can help you to learn more about love and find a measure where you're at in regards to if you want to love or not. Loving and having a desire to love in a relationship is pretty important if you want the relationship to grow and develop and to be a close and connected one. We'll briefly cover that we're a human soul again because the soul is the real conversation or the real interaction we're having with another person and being truthful and transparent and honest and open about what you truly feel and think in regards to the four questions that you can ask in a relationship and also in regards to any time that you're doing self-reflection is the most helpful and rapid way to grow and um, develop in a love-based manner. I'll also cover if both parties are aiming for God's truth rather than trying to get what they want out of a situation that that's a good way to to work towards a relationship that is based on love and truth and in harmony with God's way which will make a smoother more enjoyable closer more connected relationship. If you're still working through your issues with God you can just aim for love like what would love do or and again it's going to be I always just think it's almost impossible without God because if you don't understand what God's love would do then you're just basing it on the world's way and to me that often isn't feeling very good or doesn't feel very loving and there's a lot of um, problems I think with humanity's idea of what love is. I'll also cover how aiming for absolute truth or God's truth is a wonderful way to interact in a relationship. If both parties are aiming for absolute truth or God's truth, it means that you're not always invested or you know, demanding that what you believe and what you feel is the right way. If both parties are investigating towards what is you know, ultimate truth in order that you can grow and develop your relationship and you know, with the faith that you'll have more happiness and it'll be smoother and more connected and close, then you know, you need something other than your own opinions and beliefs to aim for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. I will also cover how the relationship dynamics in a partner relationship affects the relationships with children and how children reflect a lot of things that are happening within a partner relationship, as well as covering how parents substitute anything that's not happening in their relation, like anything they're not getting from the relationship, they'll often substitute in the children. So I'll speak a little bit about that as well. So let's get on with this presentation, which is about partner relationships in relation to parenting. So we are a soul and we can be, as we've talked about before, can be um, male and male, female and female, or female and male. Um, probably because I'll use myself as a bit of an example, I'm going to draw this as a male female soul. And I've spoken in previous videos how we are, we are the soul that's a real us. It's our desires, aspirations, feelings, memories, our thoughts, what we, you know, our belief systems, our experiences, our passions, our desires. That's the real us, is our soul. That's what God made, beautiful, pristine and, be and perfect. And that soul then comes into the, into the world, it incarnates via two people having sex, so our parents having sex and then we come into the world as these lovely little beings who come to find out about themselves and explore and really discover our own souls I suppose and come to know ourselves and our soulmate. So that um, image of the soul is uh, us and our soulmate and we are one soul it's not just me and them it's our soul so we are one one being. Now God's also created it that we have a spirit body and a physical body and those bodies interface or um, experience the, those bodies interface with the physical world and the spirit world. So yes, if you thought that you disappear after you die, you, or you pass, yeah, I pass is a better word to use because dead sort of is like final when you're gone, you're not really gone. Really what's happening is you're passing from the physical world into the spirit world. And that just means that your physical body dies or gets very sick and often mostly as people get older or gets all decayed and decrepit. And that 
you no longer have a use for that or really because really you don't deal with all your emotional injuries and feelings and issues, meaning that you don't let your um, emotion flow through you and flow out of you. Because if you did, your body wouldn't decay and it wouldn't um, you know, break down as it does when we age or and it wouldn't get sick. But because we don't deal with our emotions, instead we sort of lock them up and hold them into us, that has a physical effect on our body. So when we pass, we have our spirit body that we then interface with the spirit world. And then we go, we go into, um, we can like do all kinds of things there. Now, when you pass into the spirit world, it doesn't just all magically disappear. Everything that you thought, believed, felt on earth, you still think, believe, and will do in the spirit world. And from um, speaking to certain spirits and also from my, um, hearing divine truth teachings, I've come to understand that your body actually reflects all of the unhealed emotions that are in your, in, your, in your spirit body. And you can literally, if you look at yourself when you pass into the spirit world, you can see all of the areas that um, are still injured and that you haven't worked, worked through emotionally. I think that's kind of cool because then you've got a map, if you like, a physical map of where the pain you need to release is. So it's just another feedback system, as is the physical body if we're sensitive to it. And that's something that yeah, is just interesting, I think, and you could keep in mind. So here we have the soul, and here we have our physical body, and this is a female expression of the soul and a male expression of the soul, and our spirit body. So we, I suppose you could say you have you know, well, the whole soul has four bodies. <laughs> um, but for if we're just talking about me, Eloisa, I have a physical body and a spirit body, and that is connected to my soul, which is the real me. So I have a soulmate, and uh, I'm pretty excited to find out who he is and to recognise him. And but that's a process that uh, is for another discussion. <laughs> so in saying that. This is the partner relationships one, so I think we'll have to cover a bit of things about soulmate. So today we just, as a reminder, just talk, we've talked about sort of qualities develop, we've talked about how this is the real you. Now this is very important to remember because the soul, which I suppose we could, I suppose if we were drawing this, if we was drawing this kind of proper, there we are. I don't know if actually that's going to come up so well, so let's do it in... Okay, so here we have our like soul. This is our big our soul. Here is our spirit bodies, and here are our physical bodies. And as I said, this is our soulmate. Okay, so this is this is very important. And as partners, like I don't know the statistics of soulmates to be honest, of who who's together. But in our world, we have a lot of false beliefs about what a relationship and a partner relationship is. We have a lot of false beliefs about yeah, relationships in general, to be honest. I feel that there's a lot of distorted information about relationships, particularly sexual relationships or romantic relationships or intimate relationships, I suppose you could call them. And on earth, there's the belief that you can have you know, multiple partners and that there's all kinds of people for you. And if it doesn't work out, you can move on to another person. The truth is that God's made one other physical expression or, and uh, a spirit body expression of your soul. So it's like you have your perfect playmate. God thought of all of us and went, "Wow, we'll make this whole soul and we'll make two, uh, uh, you know, two, exp you know, two expressions so that this person can have a lovely relationship." And it's via relationships, I think, that we learn the most about love. Another reason why I feel this parenting program is so important, because we ha like bringing up children into the world. Then I feel it's a parent's responsibility to also teach children about relationships and also have a relationship with children and not always in the way that the earth thinks um, is a good relationship because often there's a lot of error and pain and um, distortion in the way that parents interact with, with children. So you may not have heard about the concept of soulmates yet but I know uh, for me personally I had quite a lot of feelings about soulmates at first. When I first heard about them, I thought, wow, that's so cool. It really appealed to me. It somehow resonated in my soul. I was like, wow, that's so wonderful. And I felt quite elated and quite excited about it. I was in a relationship at the time and uh, with my ex-husband. And at the time, I, I think I just wanted him to be my soulmate. I didn't feel that. 
but I just was like, oh, well, I don't want to think that it's not because that would open up a whole lot of questions and feelings and thoughts and if we're not, then maybe this relationship's going to end and there are a lot of uh, in, like feelings that I wanted to avoid. For a whole lot of different reasons, the relationship with my ex-partner has um, broken down over um, quite a number of years and we're no longer together physically. Ironically, through that process, it brought up a lot of feelings in me about the opposite gender, about myself and, and the, you know me as a, f a female. And yeah, so I've sort of been looking at a lot of gender issues and feelings and, and also had quite a lot of anger about soulmates, to be honest, and feeling like kind of it's unfair or a lot of sadness as well that potentially I may never be with my soulmate or I might not, I might not recognize him. I had a lot of fears and all kinds of different feelings and thoughts. And as I've gone through that over the la probably the last year, I'm now really curious and excited about who my soulmate is. And I'd like to really recognize them and feel who, who they are. And that feeling is, is changing. What I've realized is that I need to be myself wholeheartedly and without apology, if you like, and express who I am and my, the passions of our soul and the desires of our soul. And I've got to find out what those are because I haven't been very clear on those. I've been living a life where, you know, where I've had my own addictions and I've had certain beliefs about different things, like about being a, a, a mum and how that the role of a parent is almost more important than developing my own soul desires and, you know, passions. And so trying to enable the children to do things while not doing things for myself, which I don't feel anymore is a good thing. I think it's not, not a good example to set for children to, as a parent, to put your own passions and desires on the back burner. That doesn't mean that you do it at the expense of everyone else in the family because you do have a responsibility to children. And I do observe, uh, due to different people's beliefs and injuries and stuff um, and feelings and thoughts, sometimes parents just do what they want and almost neglect the children, have no, no input or no relationship with the children. And some parents are super involved and smothery, like too involved with their children rather than getting on with their own, developing their own passions and desires. I think both of those are sort of opposite end, ends of a spectrum and I'm not sure that they both work out. I feel that in a family you'd want every person in that family to be developing their own passions and desires and to be exploring and finding out new things and finding out who they are and what they love and what they desire to do. And I feel as a family, there's some lovely opportunities in order that you can do that. I'll talk far more about all these things as we go on, but it's, they just all, all sort of relate in. So we've covered basically that we are a soul. We have a soulmate. Now, if you're already in a relationship, you may or may not be with your soulmate. Um, over time, if you choose to love and you desire God's truth and you grow a desire to come to know who your soulmate is, and first you may need to, well, you will need to resolve the questions of, do you believe in soulmates? If not, why not? What are all the feelings that you have? And if you develop a relationship with God, you can directly ask God for the truth about soulmates. And you, it will be an emotional process I, if you're sincerely going through it, guaranteed. And that's normal. And, um, and that's a wonderful process to come to know and... I'm finding, I don't know who my soulmate is yet, but I know that I'm very excited about knowing who he is. And there's this growing uh, feeling of, of wanting to know. Uh, what I find is that every time I long for my soulmate, so I have a prayer to know who my soulmate is, I often just get the next thing of where I'm unloving or the next thing that I'm doing that's not going to support a love-based relationship. So I feel like it's so worth doing because you find out all the places in yourself that are out that are not in harmony with love or not in harmony with God's truth. And this is something that I think is quite exciting to develop and part of the process of becoming aware or part of the process of coming to know your own soul. Because if I don't know our soul, how am I going to recognize who my mate is? If I don't know what our soul loves and what God created, like the gifts and talents and 
the nature and personality that God has gifted this soul, that means I'm not going to recognize my soulmate when, when I bump into him. And maybe I've already bumped into him. Who knows? Like, I don't know yet. So that's something that I'm excited to find out. And I've realized that I need to be me, be our soul. There's a better way of saying it. Be our soul without, and I, I say without apology, that for me personally, I've often apologized when I'm more expressive or more myself. And I feel now that I need to be so firm and come to love our soul. And that means like yeah, expressing our nature and our personality and being truthful and transparent and desiring to love the, uh, um, our whole soul. So if you're just looking in the physical or in the spirit bodies, you know, that I love the other half of me, but I also need to love me. And this carries on from our, our you know, introducing uh, the concept of love and God's love and receiving God's love. I have in the past wanted to be loved <laughs> rather than wanting to love. And that was a problem in my past relationship as well and also with the children. And I think a lot of parents have this problem is that they want to be loved rather than having a, a, like a passionate desire that's pure to love, to love the other. We're happy to love our partner while they're doing what we think they should do. We're happy to love the children while we think that, they're do, you know, that we're happy with what they're doing. But do we love them just because they exist? Do we love them just because they're this beautiful creation that God has gifted us on earth? Do we love because we have this passionate desire to love others? And that's a very, very key, important point. Do we want to be loved? Or do we want to love? I'm finding that growing a desire and having a desire to love, there's a lot of joy and happiness and new understandings that come by developing that desire. As I said, I really wanted to be loved. I had children to be loved. That was one of the main reasons that I wanted to have children, along with a whole lot of other things as well. I wanted someone to love me because I didn't want to feel emotionally experience how unloved I felt. And if I um, suppose at the moment I am facing the fact of, no, I feel emotionally unloved and I'm beginning to work through that in an emotional way, meaning that I just feel how I feel about feeling unloved. And there's a lot of crying and sometimes anger and fears and all kinds of different things and beliefs I have about that. And that I'm just working through that. And that will take as long as I choose for it to take until it's all gone. And then I will no longer, pro well, I don't, I don't know what it will be like afterwards, to be honest. From what I hear, it will be much, um, yeah, I won't have a demand on somebody to love me anymore. So I won't have any expectations or feel that they should. And I, I do suspect that I will feel far more sort of content in myself. God is always loving us if we're open to receiving God's love. So it's not that we're not loved, it's just a feeling. And feelings are there just to be felt. Feelings flow through us and once they're felt, they're gone. They're not forever. Feelings are like finite. They just, they flow and then they're gone. And then you move on and there's a new feeling. Just like a little baby who's feeling what they feel in the moment as they feel it. And that's how we need, what we need to get back to and become sensitive again to as adults. Now we've discussed or revised that we're a soul. That's the real you, your nature, your personality, your passions, your desires, your memories, your thoughts, your feelings, like everything that's happened to you, that's all in your soul. Now the beauty of that is that you can work through anything or access all of that at any time, as long as you are open to. Again, it's an emotional process. All of those things got in there and they stay in your soul particularly, say, the injured parts or the errors or the false beliefs. They're sort of absorbed or collected along the way as you grow in your life. So you absorb a lot of things when you're a little child and then you start acting on those things and you start making decisions and then you start doing things and then you start cultivating different beliefs, often based or in rebellion or in rejection of what happened to you as a child. But that's what we do along the way. All of those things that we act on and make choices on they now become very much our responsibility. Like there's the things done to us which we'll need to forgive. There's the things that are, uh, we do to others and those are the things we'll need to repent for. The things that we've done to others out of harmony with love and out of harmony with God's truth and God's way, they are often the hardest things. Like they feel the most painful. 
because we true we decided to do it. it doesn't it does feel painful when we're treated badly it does but i found that because we made the choice it's sort of the it's we could have made a different choice and we didn't as parents we have a responsibility to come to see what choices we are making and where we are out of harmony with love and where we don't understand love and what we're trying to enforce on children if you like or how we in, just come to see how we influence children, the children in our care, and what our beliefs are, and how are we imposing those on the children? Because what is in your soul, and as we've said, those are the beliefs, they're the feelings, the thoughts, they're what you truly feel, not what you think or what you want to believe you feel, not like this made up facade, but what you truly believe and what you truly feel, that's what the children absorb, that's what they're reacting to. And it's um, important to know to know that about yourself and that's where truth comes in. I think that brings me nicely to this partner relationship. So we've talked about soulmates and the soul. So there's only one other person in the whole world for you, which I, I think is a beautiful concept and such a loving provision from God. It's like imagine if you just, if you find your soulmate, imagine if you found them when you're really young because you're open to it and you could feel you're, you're allowed to be your own self and express your nature and your personality and you were allowed to develop your own passions and desires and I'm not sure, maybe you like go to school one day and you sort of see, see a little girl or a little boy and you're like, wow, that like is just like the female or the male version of me or if, you know, there's the other, other part that just feels like me, they're the same person. Imagine if you met them really young and then all of the wonderful things that you could experience as you could grow and learn together. It's like having a wonderfully very best friend. That's how I kind of feel like what God's made this provision. And the more that I work through in regards to my, um, you know, beliefs or sadnesses or angers towards, you know, basically my emotions towards the opposite gender, because I feel my, my soulmate is male, the more curious I get about, you know, the opposite gender and how do they feel and what do they think, and particularly my soulmate. But also it's opening up for the, basically the other 50% of the world <laughs> of more interest in, in them and how they feel and what they, they respond to. And it, it's quite amazing that the way I think that God has created it because the process to come to recognize your whole soul, not just this, exp you know, the Eloisa part expression of it or apply it to yourself. Coming to know your whole and understand your whole soul is a really emotional process. And the beauty of it is that it can help you to come to understand uh, yourself and what you're like right now, which is very important, regardless of what that's like. You don't need to judge it. You just need to see it for what it is. And then you can come to know your whole entire soul. And I feel like a similar process to come to know God is, you know, you need to find out who God is. Coming to know another person involves wanting to know them, being interested in them, wanting to find out about them, you know, listening to them, um, being curious, spending time with them. And there's going to be a whole lot of different actions you'd probably take in order to come to know someone, whether you're a soulmate or, or just in a relationship, as we're talking about partner relationships, we're talking about an intimate relationship. And those same things, you know, as an aside, getting to know God, you know, you're going to need to spend time with God and have chats and learn to feel because God feels, you know, communicates through feelings. I also feel that people feel through feelings. We have another tool. We have words and, you know, if you're in the same place as a person, you can see their body language and, you know, we can... I feel like we rely on those things sometimes, but actually where it's all about feelings and we're really, if you can... The more we can feel other people in the sense of be sensitive to what their feelings are, what their motivations are, their intentions, their desires, who they are, their personality, their nature, that's when you really come to know a person. A lot of what people say about themselves or about others, I don't know, some of it's real, some of it's a lot of facade and not really the real thing that's going on. And depending on the person, depends on how real they are in the sense of how truthful, how honest, how transparent they are about their own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, ideas, um, whether they'll, they'll express their personality and nature. And all of these things I see as wonderful gifts and ways to discover um, and come to know others. So as we're talking about um, soulmates or our partner, 
Um, again, as I said, you might not be in a soulmate relationship. You might not even want to be with your soulmate. You'll need to work through those, those issues. From my understanding of divine truth, the soulmate relationship is the most, like it's got a, it's like I, I, I visualize it as like a magnetic pull. And the more you are yourself, the more you express yourself, the more you emotionally work through, the more you are your real nature and personality, the more magnetic, like the, your, your magnetic field for your other half of you is going to pull them in even stronger. Um, and I feel like, yeah, there'll come a time if you do, if you do work through all of the issues that are out of harmony with love and truth and you come to truly know and understand who you are and your soul's nature and personality, that if you are in a relationship with someone who's not your soulmate, you won't be able to stay in that relationship. It doesn't mean that it will be a messy breakup. You'll just come to a point of understanding where you'll be like, well, we're not soulmates, so there's no point for us to be together. And, you're pro you know, and if, if both parties, this is hypothetically in a best case scenario, both parties worked through any issues they had with the opposite gender, and they had a pure desire for their soulmate, eventually, you know, if they were originally in a relationship with each other, they'd part and they'd find their soulmate and they'd probably remain friends. What I notice is that mostly breakups are not very amicable. There's a lot of pain and suffering that goes on between, um, between parties because no, either one or both parties don't deal with their own emotional feelings and they want to blame the other party and they don't want to work through the issues that were like exposed in that relationship. I feel relationships are a wonderful way to learn more about yourself, about, um, about everything really, about God's laws and about truth and about love, about being humble, about um, faith. It, it, it's a wonderful, I feel like that's why God made relationship, like there's seven billion people on the earth and every person you meet, you have this potential to learn things about yourself and about them. And relationships bring so much joy they can also bring so much pain. The pain, though, I feel comes from a lack of truth, a lack of transparency, a lack of desire to love in the relationship. And I suppose you could just say a lack of desire to love and then all of those things because truth is always loving as well and part of love is being humble and part of love is having faith and part of love is taking action and part of love is, you know, so we'll, I'll just summarise it down to like it's basically your lack of desire to love causes the pain in a relationship. If you were humble and you just felt all of the pain as it came up and you released it, I think your relationship would be far more smooth and, and better. I know for certain that when you're more truthful in a relationship, it's far more attractive. Like the, um, both parties get, when they're both truthful, there's a lot more chemistry and uh, closeness created. Truth creates closeness and connection in any relationship. So very important to, to look at why you don't want to be truthful if you're not and to, if, you, if you're feeling sort of dissatisfied in relationships, work out why, find the why. What is it that's happening? Do you want to love? If not, why not? What do you think is love? Is it really loving? You know, like all these different things to work out. Now Jesus came up with some four questions in a partner relationship which I want to, to share. I feel that these questions are just a wonderful reference tool in any, like in your partner relationship, to go back to time and time and time again in order to reflect on and to see where you're placed and measure, you know, where you're at in regards to love in a relationship. So I'm going to read those um, questions out. I'll also write them on the board um, for your reference. And they're, they're tools that you can use, or the questions that you can reflect on and apply to your relationship to figure out what's going on. Jesus has done a number, of, like a lot of relationship talks actually, and on soulmates as well. For anyone who's interested, visit the divinetruth.com channel. The, these questions are taken directly from one of those talks and there's some FAQs as well where the questions are actually um, presented and then elaborated to an extent. There's, um, there's more, I'm sure, that Jesus and Mary could say on these subjects. The first question is really that comes to it in a partner relationship is do you want to love? It's that simple. Do you want to love? If you don't, it's worth working out why. 
The why is the reasons that you have for why you don't want to do something. And if you can find the reasons, then you can change them. The reasons and the why also can help you to find the cause, like of, of what is the actual thing that causes you, say, in this instance, not to want to love. But this is a principle that you can use across anything that you do. Find out why, like you want to find the cause of what's happening in your life. So, I, you know, if, you, if your answer is no, I don't want to love, then figure out why. Is it because you want to be loved? Is it because you have um, erroneous beliefs about love? You think it's going to hurt. You think that you're going to be hurt. You, you feel that if you open your heart and you love someone else, they're going to attack and hurt you. Do you think that you're already loving them and that they're just not loving you enough, which isn't really loving them? <laughs> Do you, you know, what are your specific beliefs? What are your beliefs about love? Why don't you want to love if that is, is how you feel? Now, if your answer is, yeah, I really want to love, you know, I really want to love, then measure, well, are you being loving? Now, again, it's going to be hard to measure if you don't have an education in love, but you can look at it, apply it like to basic, basic ethics again and say, all right, well, what I do to my partner, would I like that? Is that a really a loving thing to them? So if you have an expectation that you're, you know, the man in your life takes out the rubbish every time or your partner, because it might be two females or two men, your partner is the one who should do all of the jobs you don't like doing. That's not love. That You might think that's loving to you. It's not loving to them. Or you may have an expectation that, you know, your partner is the one who looks after the, the children all the time. And, you know, you might have an expectation. You know, look at what your expectations and demands are. They may have expectations and demands on you. So this is, this is something that you can reflect on with your partner. I do suggest if you're going to do it that way that each party goes off individually, looks at and really like spends time feeling about this question, do, you, do I want to love? And feel about it for yourself. Be very, very, very honest with yourself. I suggest don't judge the answers. Don't, you know, like just, just let yourself feel and be honest and truthful and open with yourself about what your real feelings are. Depending on the relationship you had with your partner, you then might want to share with each other the truth of what, what's going on. And I guarantee if you're sincere and, and humble, meaning that you're open to feeling your own emotions, it will bring up feelings and emotions in you. Just remember as a partner that you came into the relationship as an adult or as a, um, you know, you might have met when you're a teenager and depending how old you are, but you are at least semi-growing, I suspect, if you're, you know, if you're in an intimate relationship. And if you are, then remember that you bring in your, I can, your baggage with you. It's like, you know, you never enter a relationship just as a clean slate. If you've been in previous relationships, you're going to have a whole lot of feelings and beliefs that you might not have worked through and, you know, things that you, demands and expectations that you have from a partner. Those things you brought before you met your partner. So they're not your partner's fault. <laughs> they're already with you. If you've been in a long-term relationship with a partner for many, many, many years, now there might be certain things that you've done to, you know, to each other that have been hurtful or have some pain attached to them. But again, before you came into the relationship, in most cases, those things were already in you. Like you already had an opening to receiving certain things or doing certain things in your relationship. So this is not a blame game. This is about you feeling and coming to know how you feel and what you think and what is going on for you personally. This one question, do I want to love? It has so, like I just ask it all the time. I ask it in regards to partner relationships. I ask it in regards to my child, children um, relationships. I ask it in, in regards to relationships with friends, I with strangers, with the rest of humanity. Do I want to love the whole of humanity? Do I? You know, do I want to love people who I feel uncomfortable with? Do I want to love? Obviously not. Like if I feel uncomfortable, then there must be something in me not doing. But if I have a desire to love, I can work through that thing. Do I really want to love people who have done what seem to be, you know, atrocious things in the world or, or violent acts or people who 
you know, that might be less than that, might be just be condescending people. Do I want to love people who don't treat me very well? Do I want to love people when they're angry? Do I want to love people? Like, do I want to love can be applied to, e to any, anything that you do. And it's a wonderful reflection question to feel about in any circumstance. It also can be applied to the environment, just as an aside. So do I want to love the environment, the natural environment I'm talking about? Nature and the trees and the earth and, and the seas and all these kind of, all the oceans and things like that. So do I want to love is quite an essential question to resolve in an emotional, heartfelt, soul-based way. Again, remember the principle that I've talked about earlier, no change occurs unless it's soul-based emotional change. And self-reflection is an emotional process so it's about your feelings and your real feelings and your real beliefs and your real motivations and your actual intentions. That is what you're looking for when you answer this question. Now, as Jesus shares in the talk on relationships, there's four um, questions but, or, that relate to do I want to love. And those four questions are need to be applied from your perspective towards your partner and also from your partner's perspective towards yourself and themselves. So there's the questions that are going to be applied because there's two parties in a relationship towards me um, and how, you know, do I want to love myself and do I want to love my partner? And for your partner, does your partner want to love you, themselves and does your partner want to love you? So these are the four questions. One, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? I'll just redraw the little image of the soul, no smaller, and then we'll write the questions up as we go along. So the first question is, what would love for myself motivate me to do for myself? So the second question is, what would my love for my partner motivate me to do for them? So the third question is, what, do I, what would my partner's love for themselves motivate them to do for themselves? The fourth question is, what do I feel my partner's love for me motivates them to do for me? Now that's what I'd ask, then your partner's going to ask them from his or her perspective as well. So both parties need to ask those questions for themselves and answer those for themselves in order to gain an education about love and what love is all about. And these are questions that you can refer back to again and again and again in order to start exploring what love actually does in a relationship. I feel this is a wonderful place to start and that's why in this video we're exploring these questions first. So you have the four questions. As a reminder, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? What would the love, my love for my partner motivate me to do for my partner? What would my partner's love motivate them to do for themselves? And what would my partner's love motivate them to do for me? And both parties need to ask those questions. So if I'm in a relationship, I need to ask those questions to myself on all four areas. And then my partner would need to ask those questions on all four areas too. Now if you notice, the first two questions are about me loving myself and also me loving my partner. And the set third question is about my partner's love for themselves. There's only one question about the partner loving me. So I notice in relationships that there's often a, a demand that the other person loves you. There's a lot of different dynamics in a relationship. One of the key points, or the principles is, do I want to love? And that is a decision I need to make. And do I want to love is going to be a question that's going to come up all through this Parenting Principles program. It's going to be raised again and again and again into different situations. Because as a parent, we need to resolve that question of do I want to love? Do I want to love myself? Do I want to love my partner? Do I want to love the children who are in my care? You know, when I say in my care, because I'm referring, specifically saying it, because we're all God's children, including, you know, earth parents' children. They are still God's children, and we are just caring for them as they grow old enough to actually explore and, and investigate the world for themselves and make their own decisions. So we have this lovely gift of having an interaction with one or multiple souls as children and to actually give them a gift to teach them about God's laws and a have, that it's possible to have a relationship with God and about love and truth and humility and anything that we've learned about love. So if we haven't learned about love, 
we're not going to be very good educators. And if we don't understand how, you know, what love does or even, and if we don't want to love, probably going to make some pretty bad decisions and treat other people unkindly and in an unloving manner, which results in a lot of pain and suffering in the end if we continuously do that. So these four key questions I feel are very, very helpful in a partner relationship to start to analyse and measure where we are in regards to, to love. And you might find that you just want to be loved. Now there, if you've got a starting point, you can be like, well, I really don't actually want to do a lot of loving in this relationship. I want to be loved. Or you might find that, you know, you actually just want to give a whole lot of things and not love yourself. Well, that's not loving either because you need to be self-responsible and love yourself. And then there's going to become all of these like barter-based things where you want someone else to love you or you lo like love someone else at the expense of yourself, which is not really being loving. I've done that personally. And you get something out of that because it makes you feel certain things or fills in certain holes really to avoid feeling some pain and uh, beliefs you have about, you know, loving yourself. But it's very important that both parties love themselves and both parties have a desire to love the other. Now this applies, as I said earlier, to all relationships, but in this context we're talking about partners. You could also apply these questions to God's love and you could say, you know, what would God's love motivate me to do for myself? What would God's love motivate me to do for my partner? What would God's love motivate my partner to do for themselves? And what would God's love motivate my partner to do for me? And so that would, if you're having a relationship with God and developing a relationship with God, then you could start like looking at uh, the different ways that these questions can apply. So the first one is, I suppose, investigating. And if you don't know much about love, again, you can refer to ethics of treating the other person as you'd like to be treated. Again, sometimes we want our addictions met and we think those are loving, so it doesn't mean that it will be purely loving relationship. But I have used ethics as a method to, to figure out what is and what isn't loving, and it does make a relationship much nicer and smoother and more enjoyable if, if both parties are ethical with each other. Even one party being more ethical in the relationship has a positive effect on the relationship in my personal experience. I feel our relationships are a wonderful way to learn more about love. I also feel relationships are the greatest source of happiness, actually, in, in, on earth. And I know there's a lot of pain in a lot of people about relationships or past relationships, often pain with your parents or your siblings or ex-girlfriends or ex-boyfriends or various relationships. There might be a whole lot of pain in the relationship you're currently in due to the choices and decisions that you've now made in order that you're where you are right now. So this presentation is, um, we've, we've talked about how do you want to love and that's assessing where you're at in regards to love. Like, do you want to? And you need to be honest. If you don't, then figure out why not. Now if you're doing this um, partners together, you can take, I would, I'd really do recommend going and feeling on your own. I just notice often with partners, relationships, that it, you influence each other or you don't want to say certain things in case you offend your partner or there's a certain dynamics that happen in different, different relationships and sometimes just taking some time on your own to figure out what you feel and think is very important. Now, I do feel if you're in a partner relationship, the more truthful, honest, transparent you can be with one another, the better the relationship's going to be. Now, if you're already based your relationship on lies and deceit and facade and being what you think your partner wants or being what you want and you want your partner to reinforce what you want to believe about yourself, then being truthful and transparent might shake your relationship up a little bit. There might be some conflict and there might be some times where you don't feel very close and connected for a while. Don't blame the other person if, if this does happen and, and don't. I feel really important to suspend judgment of yourself or the other person because those things destroy relationships, they don't help and they also block you feeling how you really feel about things. If you apply the four primary qualities to your relationship and the way you interact with your partner, so love, truth, faith, humility, if you apply that in your relationship sincerely, then though even if there is conflict or turmoil or you start actually shaking up your relationship a little bit, you will get through it and be able to build a relationship based on love and truth and faith and humility. 
um, among you know, other things, but qualities that are actually strong and a foundation based in love. What I observe in the relationships in the world today is that most relationships are based on codependence and addictions. They're not based on a pure desire to love one another. So eat both parties coming together and saying, I want to love you or I want to learn more about love and I want to know you out like our soul if we're soulmates and I want to find out if we're soulmates and those things I do now feel would be better to resolve before you you get into a relationship with somebody because I think it can it doesn't mean that you can't have friendship to resolve a lot of different things if you are already in a relationship and I've been in a number of relationships personally they're all opportunities to learn more about love just as having children is a beautiful gift to learn more about love and truth and God and our Creator and all of these different things. And I just feel that, yeah, relationships, there's this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to do that. I don't feel that a lot of relationships are based on love, and I don't feel like a lot of partners actually desire to love each other genuinely, truly, through thick and thin. I feel like often it gets to a point and uh, there's a big event in the relationship and one or both parties, you know, there's a number of different scenarios I suppose, but one or both parties doesn't want to deal with the emotions that they have about that so they either both leave and break up or they stay and they become more and more resentful and withdrawn and sort of n not close and connected anymore but they stay in the marriage for various different reasons but it's not a happy you know, marriage or Otherwise, often, you know, there might be other things that happen in a relationship. One party does something that the other party doesn't like and then the other party punishes, you know, them and the other one feels bad because they did something and they never resolve the issues. So what I'm encouraging you to do is become open and honest in your relationship. Say what you feel. Say what you think and not attack the other person for it. Like have some open discussions about what type of relationship you genuinely want and do you want to be close and connected and... Do you want to love each other in a relationship or is it a marriage of convenience? Is it a marriage where you just, you know, want to get your addictions met or you just wanted to get into a country or, you know, be honest about why you're in the, your partner relationship. And if you're not in a partner relationship yet, I suggest figuring out, well, what is it that you're wanting from a partner? And when you, if you're in it, this question applies to whether you're in a relationship or before you enter a relationship. Figure out what your demands and expectations are on your partner. Figure out what it is that you're going to expect them to do, what you think that men should do, what you think that women should do, what you think that a partner should do if you're in a same-sex relationship. Get honest with yourself about yourself, your expectations, your demands and what you want. What I've noticed is for me personally, and I see this for so many people, is sometimes like literally we have a list of things and we believe, we write them, we, sometimes people write them down literally. Sometimes it's just uh, feelings that you have and then when you meet the person who meets most things or the majority of things on your list, it's like, bam, yep, I'm, I'm with this person. Sometimes what we think, you know, what we write down on our list and what we actually attract are two completely opposite things, which means that somehow we're not matching up, we're not actually being honest with what our soul's desires are. We're more in our heads and thinking about, about what it is. And I've, I've done that personally. I've thought that I wanted something and then sort of been like a bit clueless about, well, why have I ended up with, with this when I thought that I wanted that? And what I've come to, to know is that my soul creates the reality that I have right now. So what I have right now in my life, this includes, so we're talking about partners, so if it's your part, whatever partner you have, or if you're not in a relationship and you want to be, no, you, you don't want to be because <laughs> you're not in one. Sometimes you may be separated for certain reasons where you may have been abused or, or hurt in some way and I don't recommend staying in a relationship like that. I figure, you know, I think if you're unsafe then leave but figure out and work through the reasons that you went into that relationship in the first place. What was it that attracted you to that? Why did you end up there? Why did you end up in a position of, of you know, being abused? All of these questions and principles or the beauty of them are is that you're finding out more about you and that means your whole collective soul, but we also need to find out about, like so, Eloisa portion of, the, of, the, of our soul, of whoever my soulmate and I are, I also need to discover and find out, you know, about me, about my expression of our soul, and about how, what our soul, you know, what the feminine expression of that, of our soul is.
once I, f I feel like I've come to love and to accept and to be and to, you know, to express our soul, then I'll be open to seeing and recognizing and meeting the other half of our soul. And I think there'll be a whole lot of other things to, to then to, to come to understand. As I said, that's uh, how I, what I would, I'm heading towards with a soulmate relationship, but I haven't been in a soulmate relationship yet. Though my, my last, uh, my previous relationship, I acted as though it was a soulmate relationship. I became, tr I, I decided I wanted to be truthful in a relationship. I wanted both of us to be truthful actually. And I wanted to have a love-based relationship. And I did everything that I could personally to start that, that happening. And that broke down a lot of things in, our relation, in the relationship that I had with my ex-partner. And we ended up um, separating because he didn't, he didn't want personal truth and he didn't really want to make some changes for himself. And there's a lot of intricacy and different things that happened that I'm not going to go into just at this moment. But it really came down to the fact that I really was seeking for, for truth and a love-based relationship and aspiring for that. I, I still don't fully understand what that is in its purest form. And he wanted me to remain the same way that I'd always been because that met his addictions and his demands and things like that. So he didn't want more truth because that meant that he'd need to also feel some things and our relationship began to shift and change. And I didn't want to accept the way that I'd been treated anymore. And as I started saying, no, I don't feel like that's okay anymore. I don't feel like that's loving to myself. So if we're talking about those four questions, you have to look, well, what would love do for myself? What would love do, you know, for... Um, what would my love do for my partner? What would my partner's love do for themselves? And what would my partner's love do for uh, me? In my last relationship, my love of myself, I was compromising. I was giving that up in order to so-called love in the relationship. But I want a lot of addictions met as well. And I wanted certain things from the man and him to do certain things for me and to make me feel a certain way. So I started breaking down all of those aspects. And I still am working through a lot of different things. Like, Having this time, you know, being apart and on my own for a period of time um, is, hel is helping me to sort through some things that when I was in the relationship, I was getting emotionally met, if you like. So uh, there were certain feelings that when I was in the relationship, I was valid. I felt quite validated as a woman and, you know, that a man wanted me. And if I stayed there, then I didn't have to feel the sadness I have that if I don't have a man in my life, I don't feel that. So, yeah, and, I, and as I said, I'm a sp I really want... I want to work through anything in me now that's preventing me from having a, having a love-based relationship. And I'll continue to do that and I'm looking forward to meeting my soulmate at some point and then we'll have all kinds of dynamics to, move th uh, to work through. So what I'm sharing on this video and what I'm suggesting on this video is things that I have done in my own relationship. Um, it was kind of a one-way uh, street though. There were certain times when both my ex-partner and I were truthful with each other about whatever we were talking about or whatever was going on in our life at the time. And that definitely made us more connected, more um, open with each other. We felt more sexually connected as well as emotionally connected, which was a lovely feeling at the time. It was really nice. So for me, truth is a, a really big... Uh, <laughs> um, it's a big thing, I like it. I, I want more of it in a relationship because I can see how close it can bring you together, even in really hard times and even when we make choices that are really out of harmony with love. Truth can help us get through those things. I also found that aiming for God's truth or absolute truth on, on any matter in a relationship is, an essential, is essential to move forward in a relationship. It's very hard if both parties think they're right. Like, no, what I'm saying is right. No, what I'm saying is right. You're always going to have a fight and you're never going to move through it. So instead of trying to be right all the time, instead of the other person being the one who's got the problem, I do suggest looking at yourself and going, all right, well, what in me here is out of harmony with love? Because we all, until we're at one with God and perfected in love, we are going to have issues. We are. It's just how it, how it is. And if, we, if you're humble enough to look at yourself first and say, okay, I'm having a problem in this relationship. Me and my partner have just had a big fight. Okay, what's the fight about? What's, how do I feel about this? What's my contribution to this? What have I done that's out of harmony with love? Or 
What have they done that's out of harmony with love and how do I feel about that? Am, am I able to just love them with no other feelings or do I have jealousy coming up or do I have a feeling that they're treating me badly and if so, why? Work that out for yourself. Take the time to self-reflect, be very truthful with yourself and work those things out for yourself. Rather than being like, I'm right, no, I'm right, no, I'm right, you know. Aim for, okay, what's God's truth on this matter? How does God feel about this? How does God feel about the way I'm treating my partner? How does God feel about, you know, this? Is it really loving or isn't it? And if it isn't, then emotionally work through the reasons why you don't want to love in that situation. Now, ideally, if both parties did this, you can see that a relationship would be pretty smooth. You'd both be communicating very, very openly with each other. There'd be a lot of communication. You wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be scared or frightened about telling the truth of just how you feel. You wouldn't be worried about sharing things. You would just say things, you'd feel things, and then you'd continue, you know, and you'd probably do a whole lot of fun things together and have a lot of different experiences so you could find out what you like doing and what your personality and nature's like, and you'd love that about the other person. Let's say if you were both super sincere and working towards it. In my experience and observations, there's very few couples who are actually doing that in the world. Very, very few. I feel privileged to have some friends who, uh, to me, are an example of moving in a direction of actual love, of they're open, they're transparent. When there's a problem, they nut that out. They talk about it. They, they don't let it go until it is resolved. And sometimes that means they have times apart and then they come back together and the love is the most important thing in the relationship. And they're always aiming for God's, God's truth and how God views about love. So when I say truth, it's like how God views love. What's the truth about love from God's, God's perspective? What does God really feel about that? Now, if both parties are aiming for God's truth on a matter, now you've got something to work towards. And it can then help both parties to say, oh yeah, okay, though maybe part of what I have, you know, maybe some of my responses might be in harmony with love, some of them are not. And then you can refine and work through the issues in yourself that are out of harmony with love. So to me, having a relationship with God is very important because otherwise you don't understand what God's truth is. And if you don't understand what God's truth is, then probably you're both going to be aiming for your own, you know, what you, you think is right. And honestly, often what we think is right, I mean, what do we measure that against? Is that right because it is truly loving? Is it right because mum told us? Is it right because we think it's the best way? Is it right? Like, what's right? Um, to me, I do feel like sort of right is love from God's perspective. That would be the right thing to do if I'm going to use the word right. And often I do say right and wrong. And you could say loving and unloving. I do feel like doing the loving thing is, is right. Like it's morally the right thing to do. And I feel in a relationship, uh, we have this wonderful opportunity to learn about morality and to learn about what love is from God's perspective and to heal a whole lot of our past pain. That doesn't mean that you go in there using the other person to do that. I don't, I don't feel that's a very good, uh, a good motivation to go into it. But if you go in with an intention to love, then all of those things are going to be exposed and you are going to work through them in a loving manner. That means that you're going to love the other person through it and you're also going to love yourself through it. And that's a whole education in itself. Probably need to talk more about love in detail in, a, in another video, like about, you know, how, we're, we're, I've talked about the tools and these preliminary videos are a lot about covering, I suppose, the surface and the basic concepts and ideas and different self-reflection questions that we're going to go back to and I'll revisit again and again and again throughout the videos. That's to introduce you to various principles and, you know, like, so in this video, it's like, do I want to love? That's a principle in this video and the theme of this video, if you like, you know, do I want to love? There's, there's the, the question, and it is that simple. All the other stuff is just detail. The main question is, do I want to? And however you can work that out in whatever method that works for you, do that. I'm just offering some suggestions and some ideas on how you could move forward in, in finding out more about yourself and answering that question in an honest, open, you know, humble way for yourself. Um, as I say, I've talked about also in this video, just communicating, communicating with your partner. It's something that so many people don't do. And in this day and age of technology and 
I suppose I'm talking, uh, you know, well, I don't know what it's like in, in, in a lot of other countries, but I know in the Western world, you know, devices are just like a, man, people are just glued to them, you know, and kids now glued to them. Give up the device and actually talk to your partner. <laughs> have, a, have a physical, true, real relationship. And when I say physical, have a spiritual relationship. Because that's another thing I think to cover is that um, we've talked about how you've got a soul and then you also have your spirit body and your physical body. What you're doing in your sleep state when you're in, you know, your, your physical body is resting and then you're going and you're still, you know, rocking around and doing stuff in your um, spirit body. And often people are not actually on the earth-based relationship. They've had, they're having multiple other relationships in the spirit state. And, and again, I suppose that brings me even on earth. Are we really faithful to our partner? Or are we, you know, flirting and, and, you know, having sort of emotional relationships with other people where we don't get our, um, you know, our, what we think are our needs or our wants or our addictions met by our, um, by our partner? And that brings me to a very important part relating this partner relationship to children. Anything that you are not getting met in your relationship with your partner you're going to substitute with children, the children in your care, your children. They're God's children, but for ease of terminology and just right now, you know, if you've got, if you've got children, and say if you've got multiple children and you've got, um, you know, boys and girls in your family, then often the dynamics turn out that, say, the dad often substitutes with his daughter what he's not getting with his wife or what he feels he's not getting with his wife. And the mother often substitutes with the, um, with the son and gets what he's not, you know, what she's not, what she feels she's not getting from her, her par her partner. So if in the same sex relationship, it's going to have a slightly different dynamic. But again, depending on the gender, what you didn't, if you're in a same sex um, relationship and say you have a male and a female child, you probably use substitute what you didn't get from daddy with, you know, with your son and you probably substitute what you didn't get with mummy from your, your daughter. Uh, you know, if that's if you're a single parent or if you don't have a partner or... You know, there's a lot of different dynamics. But the point is, is that anything that we don't emotionally deal with, we are going to substitute somewhere else. Now, often we have partners and we substitute with them, or sometimes, you know, a partner will fulfill a lot of needs that we have in us. And so we don't feel... or wants or desires or you know, different things that are going on. Now, if you don't, if you start breaking the relationship down with your partner and you're not close anymore and you're not connected and you're not interested in them or you're angry with them or you're upset with them or you no longer communicate with them, you're going to substitute your kids. And if you're honest or, and even just observant whether or not you have kids, you can see this happening all the time. You can see, you know, the mothers and their sons and the mothers treat their sons as though they're their partners but just not necessarily having sex. Some emotionally um, are sexual with their sons, which is very, very damaging for the child and very damaging. The same with fathers and daughters. Often you can see that, you know, the, daughter, the, the father is more interested in the daughter. And even sometimes, like I've seen even TV shows where basically the, the daughter is married to the dad until she gets married very, very damaging for, for the daughter. I do observe, um, and in my own experience, have actually experienced, you know, dads su substituting their daughters for their wives and actually having, you know, emotionally sexual interactions with them. And sadly, it even goes to physically, it's, you know, physical sexual abuse as well. And that can be for both, both you know, genders. Mothers can also um, sexually abuse their sons and fathers sex often sexually abuse their daughters. And that is, you know, family abuse is, is rife. It is a very, very, very big problem. And as parents, we need to take some responsibility and actually, you know, what would love do, I suppose, the question to ask is what would love of, you know, my, um, what would love for myself do for myself? Well, that wouldn't substitute a child. You wouldn't need to, if you're going to be loving yourself and also if you're receiving love from God, if you want a relationship with God, you're not going to substitute your children for, for those things. And, you know, I've done substituting with, you know, with the children and I've noticed it and I'm like, wow. It's a way, in my experience, it's a way to avoid feeling certain feelings in yourself. You just want that thing met from a child 
rather than you deal with the sadness or the pain or the anger or whatever. And it's usually all of those feelings, you know, or the fear you're not going to get it. There's a lot of different emotions that come up is what I'm saying and it could be a whole variety of things. You have to feel it to know for yourself what it's all about. If you're not feeling and you're not working through those feelings and, and experiencing those feelings, sadly, you, you tend to, and I, I, don't, I haven't actually seen it otherwise, um, that you actually do substitute. Anything that you feel that you should have or you're entitled to, you will substitute with, with someone else. Now, you know, if you don't have children, sometimes partners do this with friends. They have, you know, girlfriends who they substitute certain things or, or they go out with the guys because they want certain feelings. I mean, those are more gender dynamics, but sometimes, you know, you might have friends and, and if what you're not getting from your partner, you sort of get from your friends. And I, I don't know, it feels a bit icky to me often, that kind of um, interaction. Uh, I used to do it in the past often and now I don't feel good about it. And with children, I definitely don't feel good about it because what we end up doing with our children is that we give them a role. So for example, if a partner is having you know, some sexual difficulties or they're feeling dissatisfied sexually, then they may start substituting the child, you know, like they want attention from the child. They may not be sexual, that doesn't necessarily mean you be sexual with the child, but you know, if you know, if you know, if your wife or your husband no longer wants to cuddle you, or, or your partner doesn't want to hug you anymore, or doesn't give you any physical affection, then you may use the children to get that that physical affection. There's nothing wrong with hugging your kids. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to cuddle your kids and to to express your affection for another person. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. But if you have a feeling of being needy for that affection or you have a feeling or a demand that they should give it to you or, you know, that they should uh, somehow fill in that space for you and you've got to be very honest with yourself because often we, it, it, we get judgy and we feel like, oh, that's a bit of a gross thing, I don't, I, I don't do that. But honestly, I observe so many people and I know for myself, sometimes if I felt lonely, particularly when the kids were smaller, you know, I just want a little hug. And I thought, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. But the feelings going out of me, they didn't feel so nice when I um, later, in hindsight, sort of looked back and went, well, no, that wasn't so nice what was going on. You know, I wanted a hug because I felt lonely, not just because I had a pure desire to express my affection and, and love for that child. And this is where our motivations and intentions need to be examined of what, why, what, what is my real, real you know, reason for doing things? And this is the thing, you can take all kinds of actions. In fact, you can take the same action, but have a completely different feeling with, you know, so, so say one person might, might uh, hug the child and have this feeling of like, wow, I just want to express my affection for you and my love for you. And, you know, I just think you're a wonderful, wonderful creation. And it's just this lovely expression of, um, I don't know, of just natural love towards another person. Another person, and I suppose we have words like sleazy or slimy or, you know, a bit feels icky or things like that, maybe like, oh, I feel like I just, if I don't get physical attention, then I can't, you know, uh, cope or I need physical attention in order to feel okay about myself or I don't feel loved unless I have physical attention. All of those things now have like a feeling going out of them or some people might be like, well, I, I want to, you know, have physical attention with somebody because then that makes me feel good about myself or, I, you know, some people want sexual interactions as well. So all of those, those things, the secondary things that I'm talking about, they are not, not just a desire to love or to express affection to another person and they're not based in love. They're all unloving things. So if you're lonely or you're needy or you want it, you know, and it, with children... If, the, if those emotions go unhealed in the parents or the adults in, in the environment, in the, you know, the family environment, you're going to then set up a role for a child and you may resonate this, with this yourself. Like the child may become the substitute for, for your partner. Like they're the one who you get all your hugs from in this example. They're the one who gives you affection and then you need them. And often then when, say, they leave home, they often feel like concerned because no longer do they get, get that thing or they'll look for, say it was between mum and son, 
then they'll look for a woman who's going to do the same thing as their mummy did. But depending on the nature and personality and depending on some other factors, because if they felt overwhelmed and smothered by that, they may also look for someone who, who's the opposite as well. So there's a lot of variables here. It's not a hard and fast rule. Or say with a daughter, you can have also same gender dynamics. So a mother may have used it, um, a daughter as their confidant and actually used the daughter in order to you know, be her best friend because she wanted her to like her. Um, you know, so mummy wants to be liked and doesn't feel very liked. So she's, she's avoiding feeling how un, unloved and how unliked she feels. So then she uses her daughter as a substitute in order to be her best friend. Now, as parents, we're parents. It's not about being liked all the time. It doesn't mean you can't have a friendship. I just feel like I know for me, there's a difference because a parent will always, will in my, in, if you're aiming to be a parent as God parents, then you know you're aiming to uphold love and truth and to be humble and to ha you know to, to also teach children about God's laws and make them explicit, and make uh, and make it very obvious and and for the children to see where you know the pain and suffering when they actually break one of God's laws, and then the joy and the rewards that you get for living in harmony with God's laws. That's the role of a parent in this program. That's what I'm referring to the role of a parent as being. In the world, we have a different definition. So when you want to just be buddies with your, say in this sense, your daughter, and look, that can apply as well for a father between his son. When you want a buddy rather than, you know, or a friend rather than to be a parent, it can be damaging to a child because you then want them to fill in and have a role in your life and fill in gaps that you don't want to work through yourself. I found when I first sort of realised these things, or when firstly they were pointed out via feedback to me, and also, or not, and sometimes it was that I could see the, really the first thing was seeing the relationship I actually had with my, my parents and myself and the role that I played. And because I could feel the pain of some of the roles that I was set up in as a child, I could then sort of say, wow, hold on, I'm doing similar things with our children, or I didn't get certain things or I didn't like that, so now I've got a different area that I'm looking to create a role. And for instance, you know, having your son or your daughter as your, your buddy or your best friend, that's creating a role for them. They have to do things, you know. They feel then an obligation to their parents and that's not loving to the child. In summary of that point, anything that you are not, you know, working out in your relationship, you are going to substitute with the children in your care. And that's not a loving thing to do for the children. And it's not loving to yourself either, like, or, or your partner. I notice in many relationships a lot of jealousy and animosity between partners. Often I've noticed when a woman has a baby, there's quite a lot of jealousy from the, the, you know, the other party, um, you know, a, a man towards the woman often because, or I think it goes for any partner to be honest. Um, there's just one, one scenario. Sometimes there's quite a bit of jealousy or, uh, you know, there's a, a sort of a, a dynamic because Oh, like at times, depending on the injury of the parents. So if, if it's a mother who then sort of like focuses all their attention and, and love onto a baby, then the partner feels like neglected and left out and that they're no longer loved and they're no longer wanted and they're no longer needed. And, you know, that's not a health, there's no longer a healthy partner relationship here. And it, I, was just, I was just talking with a woman that I you know, met in the street recently and we were talking about how Often mothers uh, focus all their attention, and both parents actually focus all their attention on the children and neglect the partner relationship. And how, you know, and years go by and the parents are sort of just meeting the needs of the kids or doing whatever the kids want, substituting everything that they're not getting from their partner. And then suddenly the kids leave home or they wake up, you know, five years down the track and they say like, well, wow, hold on, we don't even know each other anymore and we're not even close and we're not connected and the only thing we have in common is the children. I don't feel like that's a very good basis for a relationship. I admit that that's partially what I've done, like I've been very invested in the children and I've substituted in various um, areas because I didn't want to feel through emotions, but it's damaging to relationship and it's particularly damaging if you're not honest, truthful and open about that. It's one thing to blame your partner and to, you know, say, hey look, it's not okay. and but 
both parties need to work through the reasons why. So we talked about so the principle of finding the cause and why we do what we do. Because if we can find our motivations, um, you know, which are our reasons for why we do what we do, we can change the reasons in ourselves. And that's the fastest way to get to, you know, the most rapid change. As children are reflectors in a relationship, they're also going to reflect the dynamics between partners. So depending on what type of relationship you have, that's going to be reflected in, in children. It's also going to be reflected uh, the different uh, feelings you have towards gender. So for instance, you might be a dad in the family and fear, have a lot of competition emotions with your own dad. If you have sons, or even if you just have one son, you know, they're going to also probably have that feeling of competition and they could, if there's, I say, an only child, may very much compete with you. Or if there's, you know, m multiple um, siblings and there's brothers, they'll often have a lot of com competition between each other. It also happens with intergender, like the boys, like the, in this example, the boy may well compete with his sister if he's just got a sister. The child is reflect, if you have, if it looks like there's a lot of competition, so in our family, for instance, um, a son very, very, one of our sons particularly, but both are, in fact, all our children very competitive and uh, different reasons. Uh, one of our sons is competing with his dad for, you know, attention basically, and his dad actually competed with, you know, his dad, so our, our son's grandfather and his dad. They both, like, compete, had a lot of competition going on. Yeah, our son's dad has quite a lot of pain actually with men about the way he's been treated by his father but that's now been passed on into into our son and he's now reflecting this competition and he's quite competitive with other boys at school he's quite competitive in the family there's a competition going on I'm illustrating the point of how you know different um, things are reflected in the family now there's also a feeling of uh, their the children's um, dad has a had a feeling of sort of competition for my attention with the children and so the children would actually compete for my attention. Now there's a lot of things that could be said about that in the sense that I felt it was like you know I'd done my duty um, when I had our first child. I didn't particularly um, want to you know I was quite I had a lot of anger come up when I had a first child. I just wanted to feel loved which I didn't actually get that feeling um, uh, satisfied with having children because obviously when you have a little baby they're completely dependent on you and, and it's your responsibility to love them really. It's actually your responsibility to care for a new baby who comes into the world and it's not their responsibility to ever love you. Love is a gift and it's one that ne needs to be freely given. Yeah, I, I did um, sort of put all of my attention into the children. Now, it didn't help that I was exceptionally like tired and just felt overwhelmed and I had a lot of um, different emotions that were coming up and so I was pretty self-absorbed and I didn't pay as much attention to, to my ex-husband at the time and he felt very upset about that but didn't feel about that. We didn't even really discuss it that much. It was mentioned from time to time but neither of us really dealt with it and that caused sort of him to feel quite competitive with the children and quite jealous of the children actually. And he then, it was, that was reflected back via the children to, to both of us this competition for my attention as well. Look, there's so many things that are reflected about a, a, a partner relationship. And if you're humble and open and to possibilities and you see children as this barometer or just reflector of what's actually happening in the family and just take it, you know, I sort of, I used to get very worried and be like, oh my gosh, and sort of take sometimes literally what was happening between them is like, oh, well, this is the worst thing. Now, sometimes literally what's happening into them is the indicator and the reflection of what's going on. Sometimes it's a bit more complex than that. And it's the feelings that are happening and how the interaction, so for me, sometimes the interaction between the children was um, how I felt about that often indicated what the issue was. But I had to be humble enough to feel the feelings I had about it in order to actually understand what was really happening. Now I had a lot of external feedback from my friends Jesus and Mary which was just so helpful because they could see far more about what was really going on than I could. And that I, I don't know what it would be like without that feedback. I do know though that you can apply the principles, again look at yourself first, feel like if you're humble to feeling how you feel and you can use those things, you know, go okay, 
what would love do here? So you can use your basic ethics if you're just starting out or if you've, you know, if you've gone through an emotional process and you have a relationship with God and you understand some of the things that love does now, then you can look at a situation. Often you can just feel that it's not right. Like I often get these feelings, I'm like, something's not right here. I don't know what it is, just feels off. Like uh, often in our family, like the children will start interacting and they have certain injuries now in them, like emotional um, beliefs and feelings inside of themselves that are out of harmony with love that they act upon. And sometimes I can just feel a dynamic and I say to the children, I just go, you know what guys, and based, because based on past experience, I know the feeling of what it feels like. I know that if it continues, they're going to have probably an all out fight and they're going to like hurt each other intentionally and in, often verbally or trying to sort of pull each other down and make each other feel bad. So now I actually, like I would just, that starts happening and I can feel there's something going on. I check in with myself and like, right, what's happening for me here? How do I feel? What's going on? And then I'll stop them and I'll say, okay, right now if you continue with what you're going to do, it's going to turn out very similar to you usually does, you know, because you're going to want to hurt each other and this is the road you're going to down. Or you could make a different decision. You could actually, you know, part, go and feel how you feel about what's happening, take some personal responsibility, and you could sort it out. Because remember, none of this is really about the other person, it's about you. And sometimes they'll go off and they'll have a feel about it. Um, one of our sons now just sort of often takes himself out. Over the last year, it's been quite interesting watching him, the young, our youngest child. He used to just fight with his brother all the time. He used to really look up to his brother. He wanted his brother's approval and his attention, and he still wants that from his dad, and he kind of played that out with his, um, with his brother. And he feels like he doesn't get, get that, and he, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't get that as much. Like, he doesn't get the attention from his dad as much as his um, oldest, older brother does. And anyway, he, over the last year, he made some decisions that every time, usually he'd sort of like try and attack his brother and pull him down and sometimes he'd even like physically hit him to try and make him stop sort of doing what he was doing or to gain some pa a sense that he might have some power or control in the relationship. Anyway, he, we had a lot of talks about that together and I pointed it out and it happened many, many, for many years actually. And the last year, um, yeah, he, uh, Archie, who's the youngest, he actually made some decisions to take a different tact and he just started leaving. He just started leaving the situation. What ended, and he'd actually go and feel about how he felt about it. And it was very interesting because now there's a lot less of that same fight. There's still uh, emotional dynamics going th um, between the boys that still haven't been resolved because they haven't fully worked through the issues. But Archie now just kind of like leaves the situation and is just like, well, no, I'm not even going to engage in that. And he finds that to be much better because, and he, he doesn't feel as bad afterwards because he hasn't taken so any unloving actions. He's actually gone and tried to sort out what his part in that is and just feel his sadness that his brother doesn't want to hang out with him or his brother doesn't want to interact with him or doesn't want anything to, whatever it is, sometimes there's a whole lot of different things going on. It's just been very interesting to watch. Whereas at the moment, you know, say our oldest two, so that's Izzy and Charlie, they're having this big, big fight at the moment. Uh, there's some dynamics in our family where women are, like men, the men in the family are superior, like that's the feeling that's being cultivated when the children were very young. I'm starting to work through those feelings to come to a place of equality of like sort of gender equality, but they're reflecting this lack of gender equality. And um, Charlie feels like he's much better than, than everyone else, you know, like his, you know, women are just sort of there for, as a resource to, to be used, you know, for his, his personal benefit. In brief, there's, there's complexities to it, but sort of in brief. Izzy obviously is a girl and she's starting to feel really pissed off about that that's the way that it's been set up in the family and she feels it's very unfair and she's very angry about it, understandably so. I don't recommend her staying in her anger about it, but she does need to feel through the anger in order to get to the sadness she feels about not being treated equally in our family and just the fact that you know women are thought of as lesser. And that's not just in uh, between my ex and I, that's to do with our parents and the parents before that. You know, It's an intergenerational feeling that's, that's come through into our family, but it's very prominent in our family and was acted out between my ex and I, and now is reflected with the children. 
Now her response at the moment is sort of to attack back because she wants some power and control and she wants to feel like, she doesn't want to feel weak and, you know, ignored and unequal and everything. And so she's now trying, like we're working with her to work through sort of her addictions. Now that's on her part. With uh, Charlie, we're having to work through the fact that he does feel like he's better than women and that he's superior and that he's, you know, and his arrogance and all of these other things. So each child is reflecting dynamics between their dad and I and also, you know, generations of issues that have come through their dad and I that they now have. And I think that that one in particular, like, say, gender dynamics in a family, that's probably an issue that many families are going to face. And again, at some point, we're going to need, like, say, in that particular scenario, if you've got a, a lack of equality between gender in a family, there's going to be anger in the women to work through in order to get to their grief about that. And there's going to be um, feelings in men that they're going to need to work through and there'll probably be, you know, anger and sadness and fear, and I'm not sure what else, in order that they actually also become equal. Because it's a little bit sort of like, in our family it's like this, here's the man and here's the woman, and here's equality in the middle. I'll have to do a little drawing too. And we need to go like this. So, you know, so that there's no inferiority or superiority. It's been interesting over the last couple of years. Um, our daughter actually has been living with me full time and not with her dad because she started to speak up to her dad about how it felt to be in his company and what it was like and all of these things and sort of reflect back, like be the barometer and saying, and to both of us, to both her dad and I, there's a problem in our family. <laughs> there's a problem with how women are treated in our family and it needs to be resolved. That was sort of like how I see what she was reflecting back to us. Anyway, I encouraged her to speak up with me and her dad about it. And her dad pretty much like, dismissed her and ignored her, didn't listen to her, and still doesn't really understand that there's even a problem. And he just see, he blames her and feels like she's angry. So that's not, that's not the loving direction to take. And it also has actually ended up in him not having a relationship with his daughter, which she feels very, very sad about, and she'd love to have a relationship with her father, but she feels like, to, and to do so, she has to modify herself in such a way that feels so terrible to her that she doesn't want to do that. What's been quite fascinating to watch is that since she has had not been in that environment, and I'm really encouraging her to work through her anger, and she's got really good friends who are also encouraging her to work through her, her anger and to be more herself and to actually express how she feels and things like this, is that she is becoming more open in, um, with who she actually is. Now there's a lot, lot of things going on for her and she's not always very humble in, to the experience. And as I mentioned, like she will drop down into her grief a lot of time, like at times, and feel how the real, really what the issue is, is just this deep sadness that she has that she doesn't feel loved um, by her dad in this situation. And she'll feel some of her grief about that, but often she wants to avoid the grief because as she says, she says, well, it makes me feel weak and powerless and that they'll just take advantage of, you know, that men will take advantage of me and that they won't, love, you know, that they'll just make fun of me. And she has a lot of beliefs about how men will treat her if she lets herself fully grieve. And they, those feelings you might find that you also have about grief. Both men and women may feel those so actually some similar feelings. That if you grieve, you might you're weak, and that there's something wrong with you, and people will take advantage of you and treat you badly, and all of these things. Because there's a lot of uh, judgment about emotion in the world at the moment. So it doesn't have to be that way. If we all become 100% emotional beings, it could be very different. But until people change their relationship to feeling and expressing emotion, um, you know what is he's going through at the moment is something that many, well, I think most women are going to have to go through at some point, and also men will need to go through as they become more connected to, to their own grief. So in our family, those are just a couple of, there are just so many examples I like could talk about. Every day there's something that's uh, reflecting back to me what's happening in our family and the dynamics between, because we have two boys and a girl, there's all the dynamics between the kids are highlighting all of these different injuries and, and belief systems and emotions that aren't yet healed and basically lack of love in our family. And what I love about it 
and I see as such a gift is that they are making it, it, exposing and making it explicit all the problems that are in the family. And that I think is one of the gifts of having children. If you see them as, a, um, as reflectors. Again, it takes some humility because what I observe and when I, before I'd heard about divine truth, I wanted to make it somehow the children's problem. Like, well, you're the one who's got the behavior problems or you're acting out or you've got an issue. I feel completely the opposite now. Now, every time there's an issue, I'm like, okay, what is this trying to show to me? What, what is happening for me? What is this, this highlighting about the dynamic in our family? What is this showing me about the relationship my ex-partner and I had together? What is this showing me about the gender dynamics in our home? What is this showing me about how I feel about myself? You know, how do I love myself? Do I not? Like, there's just every moment of every day that I'm in the company of children. And it's not just children. Children just are, like anyone you interact with can be highlighting all of these things. It's just that children are far more sensitive, usually far more open, often much more transparent. And they don't have such big facades, particularly when they're small. And their facades are far, like I have to say though, I'm seeing facades seemingly get to younger and younger children faster and faster. When, when children, they're just, they're just responding. Like that's how I view them. It's like they're little auto kind of, well, no, they're not auto, they're just reflectors. A reflection is the best way of putting it. And if you have some self-reflection as a parent, then you can reflect on the reflectors, <laughs> on what they're doing and what's happening in the dynamics that are going on. Again, it doesn't matter if you have same gender children or you only have one child or whatever, it still works, the same applies. Now the beauty of the feedback system is if when they're, say when they're very, very, very tiny, a child is very, very tiny, uh, if you actually connect with the emotion in you that is causing the behavior or the issue that's going on and you're just truthful about that with yourself and that might be an emotional experience, your child's behavior will immediately change. To me, that was how I built faith in the process of, of living a life in harmony with God's way or really growing an aspiration to, because I saw immediate response, like I applied these principles that I'm sharing with you and you know, feeling my own emotions, like experiencing my own emotions in the moment I had immediate results with the children. Their behavior completely changed. And in our home, because the children's behavior reflecting their father and I, uh, reflecting all the unhealed emotions in us and our denial of expressing our emotion, that's what they're reflecting, the denial of our expression of our emotion and the unhealed emotional injuries, it caused, because we were um, the two adults in the family were so shut down to experiencing emotion, the children reflected that. They reflected how badly and how much we were shut down. And that meant chaos in our home, like absolute chaos. It just meant like there was, it was just out of control. And anyone who knows me and met us when we were that age, they will tell you that it was really unpleasant to be in our company and it was totally out of control. They didn't, you know, they will. So because my husband and I weren't honest, we weren't humble, we weren't truthful, we weren't wanting to love, we were just kind of cluelessly, blindly, blindly going around, not really understanding what was going on. We blamed the kids and just were like, well, somehow we have to sort out the kids' behavior, which is dealing with effects, not, not, um, not causes. So when we found divine truth, for me it was just like this relief because as soon as I was truthful about what was happening for me, not the kids, for me. And I suppose I asked that question that we covered earlier of like, why, what was my motivation? Like, why do I feel this way? Or why do I take this action? Or what is it really that's motivating me? Because I became truthful about those things, the behavior changed and it changed so markedly that it was just like, it went from, for instance, chaos and whatever to children quietly playing. Like there was quiet in our home. Now that was just never, never, never really happened. So for me, my faith built quite rapidly in, I suppose, when I look back, because I was like, well, hold on, I've just got to be truthful. I just, if I'm truthful and humble, good, good things happen. <laughs> so that for me was a really big motivator then to do more. And then as I've done more and worked through more and applied the principles further and uh, to more and a wider variety of situations, 
then I've had more and more and more and more and more positive on-flow effects. So I feel pretty passionate and I know that this process works. I absolutely feel like it's, for me, I looked at, honestly, there are so many parenting programs out there. And, and look, some of them have some quite good ideas, but they don't work because they don't deal with the emotions. They don't deal with the fact that it's a soul-to-soul -soul interaction between you and a child. They don't even mention the fact of a soul. There's no understanding that no change happens unless there's a soul-based emotional change. And because that is left out of all of the... I've never seen a parenting manual ever except Divine Truth um, teachings that actually looks at emotions and says, no, you know, doesn't, they, none of them look at the soul-based interactions. I've never seen a program like that. And that's where this program is different. You can apply everything that I say and you can take actions to even like attempt to apply the principles. If you do not make soul-based emotional changes and accept those principles into your soul, or you could say, I suppose, your heart, like so that this is a feeling in you, they're not going to work, they're not, just not. Like, truth works, like when you're truthful, just being truthful, because you're more in harmony with God's laws, good things happen. But to really sustain and have permanent change, like permanent positive change, like that is absolute change, like it's like forever change, that comes from doing the soul-based emotional work. And if you don't do that, you won't get the results. And the beauty of that is that it's a feedback system because you know that if things, if there's not like change in your, in your home and it's not permanent, then there's just more to go on that issue. It means you haven't really like dealt with that fully yet. And that's what I love about this process is that I don't feel like I have necessarily cleared any like total cause of something, but I feel like just chipping away, you just feel, 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 just keep feeling and regularly feeling and doing it over a period of time, life improves because you've chipped away at some of the causes or some of the cause of, of what is actually creating all of those effects. So the effects all get like less. And that gives me faith in the end. I believe that if you got rid of the entire cause, all effects to do with that cause would be completely gone. And that's a law of cause and effect. So that is actually a law that God's created for us to, um, to do. And, and, you know, there's a, there's, in physical science, there's the law of cause and effect, you know, and how, how that works as well. Well, in a spiritual way, that also works. There's, there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, developing the qualities of love, truth, faith, humility, of applying those sincerely in your life. In this presentation, we've talked about, do I want to love? That's a decision that you make. It's a choice. How there's no, we've revisited that principle that we've talked about previously, that there is no change unless it is soul-based emotional change. And that is an emotional experience that you go through in order to change. And being emotional is not a something that you're just going to be for a while and then it's you're not going to be becoming you're going to become a hundred percent emotional being that is how God designed us and I feel there's a lot of evidence to that the fact that God communicates via emotion the fact that children are reflecting what's happening in our souls and they're they're totally emotional like they respond they're not thinking or intellectually aware when they're very small they only gain intellectual awareness and become more self-aware as they grow older and they, you know, start to intellectualize things. But if you watch a very small child, that's what we were made to be as well. You know, we're made to express our emotions. In a, for adults in a self-responsible way, that doesn't mean you go around like harming other people with your emotions or taking your emotions out on other people or blaming them or using them in manipulative tactics, which a lot of people do with emotions. I feel like emotion gets a bit of a bad rap often in, in society. You know, like there's, there's this feeling of like, oh, don't be too emotional. Like it's quite, people are quite condescending about emotion. There's a lot of, lot of you know, feelings around emotion that I don't think are um, very true or, or they're definitely not my experience of them. And, you, you know, if you're going to actually sincerely apply these principles and go through, you know, come to aspire to live God's way, you will become an emotional being and you'll need some courage in order to, you know, be in a world that 
doesn't really support emotion or emotional expression. You know, we're, they sort of have a spectrum and, and an allowance, if you like. There's the acceptable emotional expression, and anything too high or too low, you know, you, a lot of people get drugged for or, or criticised for. Yeah, I, I feel that emotion is a very good thing, and I notice in children, if they're allowed to express their emotions, if they're allowed to have their emotional experience, so many good things happen. Um, I was just uh, recently talking to a friend of mine and her son just had this huge cry the other day at school. A lot of things had been going on and he could like, more clearly see what had been happening and how his behaviour had been affecting other people and what had been going on. Um, I know in our family, as sometimes like, we've had uh, things, uh, emotional issues that have happened where you know, our children have, um, they didn't, none of it, our children used to find academic work quite challenging. Now, when you find academic work try it quite challenging, it's never to do with your intellect. It's always to do with an emotional or soul-based reason in you or a belief about certain things. So if you release that, the cause of why, you know, the effect of the fact that you find academic work hard, then you'll no, probably no longer, well, you won't find academic work hard anymore if you release the cause of it. And we've, I've literally had this experience in our family where, for instance, our daughter was really struggling with maths for a, lot, for a period of time and she couldn't understand the concepts and she found it really hard and she, she really didn't do well. And in fact, across the board of her academics, she wasn't doing very well in primary school, but she was really struggling to even achieve, you know, sort of a past standard. Over the past two years, like she's sort of connected more to, to her feelings. She's also left the environment with her dad where she feels quite judged and, and stuff. And over the last two years, her academics have improved markedly. She's put in a whole lot of hard earned, like hard work and effort, um, and that has contributed. So she's sort of done a combo. She's done a little bit of feeling and a lot of um, physical effort to get there, which is one way to go about it. And she has improved and now finds, like, absorbs things in a lot easier way. Um, with our youngest child, he actually, it was noticeable for him. He was quite young and I can't even remember what the reason was, but something happened and he, uh, he was just really upset. He got really angry about something and I just, um, I restricted him in the sense that I, I said, I'm, I'm not going to drop you off to school. I'm just going to let you feel how you feel. And we stayed in the car and he just lost it. Like he, when I said lost it, he got super angry, he had a massive tantrum, he just yelled, screamed, went through it, and then he started just sobbing. And he just cried and he cried and he cried. He cried for quite a long time. With, it was very interesting, within a few weeks, um, I think it was about weeks to about a month, the teacher started commenting on his academics and he'd gone from being very, very low achieving in his um, academics to being exceptionally high achieving over a matter of months. And um, yeah, I just feel it's like the more, and I just notice the more that he works through certain emotions, the more his academics improve and the more confident he is in himself and doing it. And the same is what I've noticed in our, in our other children. You know, when they have an emotional release of some kind, a lot of things happen physically for them. So to me, I know that working through your emotions and making a soul-based change is the only change that there is. It's interesting watching the kids because I didn't believe that or feel that when they were very little. So they were kind of a bit, you know, they were, they were getting a bit older by the time I made that shift and it's, they don't yet have that same belief. They haven't had, uh, our youngest has more of a belief that that is the way it is uh, because he'll feel a lot more. Our two older children, they also know that it works because they've had the experiences themselves. But they have some more sort of shut down feelings and our son particularly at the moment is reflecting his dad who doesn't believe that he feels that if he does enough physical changes that that things will you know that things will get better now that's in complete opposition to what i feel and believe so our oldest son has a very similar uh, feeling and belief and he gets approval for maintaining that belief and feeling with his dad um, and our daughter obviously she's the oldest of our children and so, you know, the changes that I've been going through have happened as she's been getting older and older and older. So, you know, she's now making, and all of them are making their own choices and decisions, but it is just quite interesting to see that um, the difference between the children and 
the like when you know the differences between where their dad and I were at in comparison to when they were born and what happened. So our youngest child, I'd heard about Divine Truth when I was pregnant with him. I'd started sort of praying for, uh, experimenting with prayer and sort of you know asking questions and trying to like figure out what you know truth was. And I knew that I wasn't being um, a good mum in the sense of that I wasn't loving the children and I could recognize that I wasn't being loving to the children. And that was a big motivator for me to want to make some positive changes so that I didn't affect the children in the way, in a negative way. And, her, and I, it felt like I was hurting them. Like I could see their responses. I could see fear being instilled in them and I could see them absorbing anger and rage and I could feel them just on the receiving end of it. And I feel like that's quite an uh, abusive thing for a child to, you know, emotionally abusive, to have to absorb all of the um, emotions of their parents. And it took me a number of years to, to be, um, well, to not be so self-absorbed and selfish, to be quite honest, in order that um, I started to look at myself and go, okay, this is, you know, if I don't feel something, that's just me being like selfish, particularly if I know about it, if I know I've got an issue and yet I do nothing about it. Well, now I'm making a choice to be very selfish and hurt other people. And I, that didn't feel very good to me over a period of time. And I suppose the pain and suffering in my life just got more and more and more and more. It wasn't, it wasn't a feeling of like, I really desire to love these kids and I want to. No, for me, it was like, wow, pain and suffering is mounting. It is getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where I just went, wow, I, I want to do something different. And then I did do something different. But it is noticeable that uh, the difference sort of between each child um, and I suppose as an eldest child, that's when, you know, we're sort of the most clueless and all kinds of stuff is happening and I hadn't like, done any experimenting or anything. By the time I got to the third child, there's a whole lot of different things going on and so you know and and it's quite interesting to track what was happening in each pregnancy and then the per, you know like how the children behave and and what sort of things they've picked up from us as their parents and what they reflect back and for each child it's quite different so i find that quite fascinating and i love i love observing other families and just just looking at what the children are reflecting and what sort of dynamics are happening between the parents and how they or each of them interrelate and what kind of relationship or lack of relationship parents have with their children. I feel like I'm going through a process at the moment of well, what does it mean to have a parent-child relationship? Like, what does that look like? I don't have any very good examples. Um, my, my parents, I don't feel, were very good examples of being loving parents. And I haven't, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm in a learning process. Parenting is not this automatic thing that you do well. You need an education in how to be a loving parent, else you're clueless, like you really are. And as I said, you know, there's so many parenting programs out there. To me, they don't work because they don't look at the soul, they don't work with emotions, and they're not looking for causes. They're just trying to deal with behavior and effects, and that's never, ever going to work. Again, unless you try it for yourself, unless you experiment, unless you test it out, and until you actually do it, you're not going to know that in your own heart. And you, you, may, you may well disagree with me. As I said, keep an open mind, try it, have a go, see what happens. Um, if you sincerely apply it, observe and reflect on the feedback you get from God's laws or from other external sources. Just reflect on that and then modify your experiments. You know, try different things, test things out. If you don't have someone who can give you direct feedback, just start some tests. Do, do something different than what you're doing now and see what happens. Just see what the results are. There's, um, you know, the Parenting Principles Program. As I said, it's just applying divine truth principles to parenting. And in this discussion, it's we need to talk about partner relationships because it's like partner relationships, parent, child, and that dynamic is all interlinked. When I was doing the preliminary, preliminary presentations, I realized that I needed to do a talk on partners 
because that directly influences the relationship you have with children. And if partners sort out the dynamic between them, a lot of things between the children, behaviours, dynamics, emotional injuries, and also if you sort out your partner relationship between yourselves, that's going to be so helpful for your children in the future because they're not going to act out in this, you know, things that they inherit from their parents. So I was talking earlier, if you substitute one, you know, uh, certain things you're not getting in a relationship with your child, you're setting your child up for a relationship like they have with you, or depending on how oppressive you are towards that child, they may want to rebel against that and go for someone who's going to sort of do the opposite thing than what you did with them. I, I imagine like what children are going to be like when they're adults. So I look at the way that I treat the children now in our care and I go, hmm, if I keep doing the thing that I'm doing for them, for instance, if I had kept cleaning up after them all the time and I never let them learn how to cook their own meals and they had no responsibility for their physical needs, what kind of adult would I create? I'd create a completely dependent adult who would have to find a partner who would do all their washing, all the cleaning, all the cooking, everything else. Well, that's my responsibility to that child to teach them some basic physical skills so they can survive in the world. And I think to make tasty food so they can actually enjoy it, you know, in, the, in, in future. Not really, really bad, bad, um, bad food. But you apply that physical example to their spiritual well-being. If you teach a child that they need mummy or they need daddy in order to do something, you know, they can't go to sleep unless they kiss goodnight. They can't function unless, you know, dad's there on the sideline at the sports field. They can't, they can't actually ask a question unless their mum and dad approve. They can't do anything unless their mum and dad approve or mum or dad, you know, it depends on the dynamics. I'm just using the illustration for both parents so because it, it applies to both parents. Again, this applies to any relationship, any combo of, you know, genders, etc. If their parents do not approve, please be aware. If I say mum and dad, it means parents, and and depend. And this will apply to any parents and any combo of parents. I'm just saying mum and dad to cover both genders. So I I often now look at okay, what emotionally am I? What dynamic emotionally am I setting up with with our children? You know, in the, in our care and. Say with our daughter, I know that she's, I have a feeling towards myself and towards women in general that we're capable, we're competent, we can get on, we can do things, um, that she's quite capable of feeling through her emotions, that she can do all of those things. Now with, um, and I had, was the way I was treated by my mother, I had to just learn how to do a lot of different things for myself and become very independent pretty early on, um, as qu very young, like I was looking after my own siblings from quite an early age. In comparison, because of some injuries and beliefs and feelings, um, you know, and the dynamic I had with my dad, when my dad set up with me, and then also the beliefs in, a, in my family, and also the beliefs in my ex-partner's family, because of all of that, the way that men are treated is, like comple is completely different. And because I also still wanted certain emotions from my dad to, to avoid the feeling of feeling how unloved I felt, and to avoid a whole lot of other feelings. I had set up a relationship with the boys where I made them dependent on me to the point when they were little, they didn't even speak. Like they had a lot of speech impediments and they didn't even have to talk because I already was doing for them before they had to ask. They didn't even have to verbalize what they wanted because I already was intuitively preempting what they wanted and doing it for them without them needing to. Now that's a very big disadvantage. Like one, they're not even able to communicate with other people. Uh, their communication was grunts and like yelling and sort of <laughs> uh, noises, if you like, like signals, basically like telling me that I was doing things wrong or whatever. Also, it creates a dependence and it's quite, cond I feel like there's a, uh, for, it depends on the reason why you're doing it. It can be quite condescending because you're also teaching them they, they can't do anything without mummy in this, in this example. It could be the opposite. Dad could do everything for the, their, you know, for the male children or for the female child. And then dad setting up, you know, this thing of like, you know, could be condescending. Uh, for me personally, I was just terrified of a man's anger and I, and I felt like I had to placate a man. So I was already doing that. And then that just set up a dynamic between me. I was doing that with my, my husband at the time. I did that with my dad. I did that with pretty much all men. So I just started acting in that same manner with um, male children. 
And so I sort of created this problem with them. And that was to avoid me feeling some feelings um, that I had that I didn't want to feel. Uh, whereas other people do it because, you know, there's other reasons. So some, some women who treat their boy children like, well, you're not competent, you can't do it without me. Like they have a feeling of condescension towards men. And so they feel like the, the man needs them, you know. Um, and so they have to, you know, so they do things. Sometimes a woman wants to be needed by the man, so she does things for him. Now, if you used it from a man's perspective, the man fear, you know, may do everything for his daughter and treat her like a princess and say, oh, she doesn't need to do anything. Uh, in saying that, often uh, there might be a dynamic between the partners where the mum might do all the cooking and the cleaning, etc., etc., and then the daughter doesn't ever even have to learn how to cook and clean. Like I've, some families are like that nowadays. So just as an, another example, you know, dad might treat her as a princess and feel like she doesn't need to do anything because it's the man's role to look after her. Now, what does that teach the daughter? The daughter then grows up feeling like, well, no, man should do everything for me. I, I should do it. So she then becomes pretty entitled and angry and demanding. And if a man doesn't do something for her, then she won't do it. Like she'll start using the man to get what she wants, just as daddy's letting, you know, her use him. And he's setting that up. So you can see all the relationship dynamics. Now you could do a same sex gender. Like if a woman, you know, has, so like, so my mother, who pretty, I suppose I was left to my own devices, if you like. And so I just had to learn how to do things for myself because mum didn't do them for me. So I just had to get on and do them. Now I think there's some really good things about that. I think uh, it's good that I'm independent and feel like I can do stuff on my own. And sometimes I, I definitely have a feeling of not feeling very loved by my mother and that I need to work through. I'm not emotionally connected and she didn't really want to emotionally be, be part of my life or, you know, she didn't interact with me and didn't want to know me and love my own, my personality or nature. So I've got some sadness of that. But as far as the physical aspects of my life, I feel quite competent to, to do certain things. Uh, except certain things that, you know, um, dad, different dynamics dad set up with me where I don't feel so, so um, able to do that. So my example that I've just used, you could actually start reflecting on your own life about your relationship with your parents. What were the different dynamics between you, your relationship with your mum in comparison to your dad? What have you learnt about gender? Like what, do you, what are your beliefs about what men do in comparison to what women can do or can't do? One or the other, like in our family, as I said, women are treated less. My dad has a feeling that men are superior, that men are intellectually superior. And so I had a belief that I'm just really dumb and I can't really do anything, it caused me to want to be a bit of an overachiever, but I still have a feeling like, oh, I can't manage that, you know, particularly, say, in maths and science, areas of maths and science. It was more acceptable for a woman to be artistically, um, you know, develop their artistic talents. And all of these things contribute to my beliefs about what I feel the role of a woman or, or what a woman can do or can't do. Now, if we, as a parent, do not deal with all of those beliefs, and they're false beliefs, by the way, because God has made our soul to be very capable, competent, and self-responsible, and able to express emotion, able to be very, you know, intellectually aware, unless we've got some injury around, you know, our um, learning things. Like, God's made us to learn. If you look at a child, they're continuously learning. They learn how to walk without an instruction manual. No one even shows. I mean, they see us walking around. There's, I suppose there's some examples, but they, no one, you don't have to like sit down and teach them. They naturally start walking. And if they don't, we're worried about it, rightly so. Well, that, the same principle of learning applies to our spiritual development. You know, if we're not spiritually growing and developing and coming to know more about the universe and more about how love works and more about truth and who, who our creator is, like God. Are these things, I feel, or just learning more about love because some people don't want a relationship with God. But you can only get to a certain, um, you know, like it, once you pass into the spirit world, if you don't want a relationship with God, you can only reach a point of becoming a perfect natural human. And that means you're perfected in love from a human perspective. Um, until you then want a relationship with God and to understand love from God's perspective, you can't progress to become at one with, la, la, um, with God. And that actually limits your development and your, I suppose it limits your freedoms in a way because you can't go higher than like, say the sixth sphere. I haven't talked about spheres of the spirit world, um, but they're sort of like locations in the spirit world that you can go to 
depending on the development of love that you have in your soul. So the more um, that you learn about love, then the more your soul expands and the more you, uh, truth you un can understand and the more about love you understand and the more about universe you can understand, the more you can just understand in general, to be honest, on any subject about anything. And as you expand, you grow and grow and grow. And, and I suppose, in a way, now I'm saying that out loud, this is just a theory, I kind of feel like because you're expanding, then you can expand into a higher space and higher space because you understand more and you're more, and you actually, your soul condition means that you're comfortable in that space. Um, say, for instance, you went straight to the sixth sphere now, you'd probably feel very uncomfortable and want to go back down to the hells or the first sphere because you'd feel comfortable there, depending on the amount of love and the level, you know, the love that you have in your soul. So, you know, that's why for me, I feel like gaining an education in love is so important. If you don't know about love and the way the universe works, meaning God's laws, and, you know, if you're in harmony with God's laws, then, you know, you, I suppose you can expand and grow and, and learn more. But if you're in disharmony with God's law, you're still learning, but there's a lot of pain and suffering that happens, and it's sort of a painful way to learn. For me, I think the uh, smooth, more enjoyable way to learn is living in harmony with God's law, and a lot of opportunities open that way. A bit of a, uh, an aside there, and all I need to, but I need to probably go in more um, detail about um, probably the spirit world and some of the divine truth basics of the spheres of the spirit world and, and what that means and, and stuff. That's just a brief overview I have covered there. Those are some examples about you know children and the way that the dynamics between parents and children play out. So if you're in a relationship, you can go back to those, you know, the, the primary question, which is, do I want to love? And then look at the four, four questions of, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? What would my love of my partner motivate me to do for my partner? What do I feel my partner's love for themselves would motivate them to do for themselves? What would my partner's love for me motivate them to do for me? And if you revisit those questions, you can, you can work a whole lot of, of different things out. If you take the example of, say, having a new baby and then feeling sort of like left out or no longer needed if you're the, you know, the other party, then there's, there's an opportunity to feel about that and then talk, you know, if we go back to our qualities, you know, love, truth, faith, humility, have some faith that if you love and that you're honest and truthful, that things are going to work out and that if you're humble, you can get through anything. And, you know, feel about how you feel about it. Like, that's the first thing to do. We've talked about in the previous ones is look at yourself first. And that's, uh, that's something that I feel is so important. Just take it back to yourself first and be like, what's, what am I doing here? Or what's the attraction for me here that's out of harmony with love? Like, where am I not being loving or truthful in me? If you feel through that first, or at least come to understand and why you feel that way, then you can also talk to your partner about it and be open and transparent about you know, your feelings and your observation and what's going on. And if your partner's humble, then you can sort of work out, well, you know, and say in this example, you know, your partner really wants to feel unconditionally loved and doesn't want to have to, you know, it could be all kinds of reasons, but maybe they don't want to have to, you know, do a whole lot of stuff for you as their partner. And maybe they just want like a baby and to just put all their attention into the baby because they feel they get more out of that. They'll have reasons about why they're doing that and you'll have feelings about in, in response to what's happening. And that goes both ways for both parties in all, in all situations. But it's better to work out your partner issues between each other than it is to substitute in a child into the mix and make them responsible for filling in you know, gaps or filling in roles or taking on obligations or, or well, no one should take on an obligation, but Rather than imposing all of our unhealed feelings onto children, we need to be responsible for working through those ourselves. I watched a movie recently, and, this, and there was a little boy, and, and this, uh, I think it was uh, something was happening with the dad, and he said, "Look, at, make sure you look after your mother. You know, you're the man of the house now." And I just cried. I was just like, "No, don't put that expectation, and that demand on that little boy." And, he later like, didn't want to do certain things because, and he, he was really, really worried because his dad had, that's what his dad had said before his dad had left. And he then felt this obligation that he had to look after his mum. And 
that if something bad happened with mum, then he was somehow responsible. Nothing in a child's like, what's happening with the parents, it's not the child's responsibility. As parents, we have a responsibility towards children, um, particularly when they're young. And part of our responsibility is to help them actually to grow up into to adults who know that they are, can be self-responsible themselves and can take care of themselves and look after themselves, and I mean physically and also emotionally, that they're quite capable to feel their emotions and to express themselves and to be themselves. And that is a responsibility. So any time that we are not helping a child to, you know, or demonstrating to a child on how to be self-responsible, we are now out of harmony with love. In our family, for example, one of our sons feels like he needs to sort of look after mum and look after dad and sort of make sure they're okay. Like he feels he has a bit of a role to do that. Um, and our daughter feels, you know, she has different feelings from, and it's very interesting because her dad has different expectations and demands than I have had on her. Um, and I've had different uh, expectations and demands on our daughter in comparison to our sons. And all of these things need to be seen for what they actually are and the truth about them and then to be worked through and figure out, well, hold on, if I want to love, I need to stop doing this thing. Now, the only way to stop doing the thing but by actually working through the cause or the reason why in your soul that you're doing that in the first place, that's an emotional, soul-based process. And then once you go through all the emotions, they will be released and you'll no longer do that physical action automatically, It'll be an automatic change. In summary, all of these things, are we started off in this little section just talking about how aiming for God's truth or absolute truth is so important. Because without God's truth, or, or it's, sort of, it's like truth is the road map. And if you don't know what God's truth is, sometimes you're flailing around in the dark and you, you, you figure it out because God's laws are showing you. And you might, you know, as, as long as you're open to different possibilities and you're open to the fact that you're probably wrong, because in my experience, I'm just wrong all the time, or have been. And I still feel like that. I just feel like on so many issues and so many subjects, I'm, I just, I don't know. I'm kind of clueless. And if you have the opening that, yeah, right, you, you're probably going to be wrong. And if you're humble enough to, to take on new information, you know, God's laws will help sort things out. And you don't need to worry too much. It's all happening. Just become more sensitive to the law so that you can feel the pain or pleasure and, or pain and suffering feedback. And, you know, that's a, a sensitization process to go through. But in summer, we sort of talked about if you want to be right and your partner wants to be right, then you're both going to think you're right. You're going to have, you know, it's going to be, it's going to pull you guys apart. You're not going to feel close and connected anymore. Your relationship's not going to feel so good. But if you're both aiming for like a common, I kind of feel like it's just a common, yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could say it's a common goal of, finding out what God's truth is on any matter, or what ab the absolute truth is on any matter, then you can like start both working towards that, and then you're both not going to be so invested in being, you know, like, no, it's, I'm right, and you're wrong, and you're to blame, and I'm all good, and you're not. It's not like that. It becomes a place where any issue that comes up in a relationship, anything that is exposed in your relationship, for me personally, I just go, okay, what's the attraction for me here? What, what's happening here? How do I feel about that? What's my response to that? Go and feel that. Then come back and, and discuss what's, what's happening in the relationship. And if your partner was also humble, they'd head off, feel all about that, come back and talk about it. And then you've got two people who can like be trying to nut out what is God's truth. The fastest way to find God's truth is obviously to feel. And via the conscience, you can have a direct relationship with God and also to have a direct relationship with God that's the fastest way to find out. Um, as I've said, if you don't have a relationship with God, and, and not many people really do, you know, and I know for me I get stuck and I can't, sometimes I'm not allowing God's love in and sometimes I'm not feeling what God feels about an issue and I feel very, very privileged and lucky to have um, some amazing friends who give me a lot of personal feedback and external feedback because without that I would not be changing and moving forward. So very, very grateful for that. But if you don't have, you know, um, people like that in your life, you can use the teachings of divine truth because at least you've got a bit of theory and you can sort of go, okay, I'm hearing something. Sometimes it's a bit hard because I've found that you listen to the teachings of divine truth, you think you know, and you sort of filter it through all your belief systems and your filters and your understanding. You go, oh, you yeah, know, I get that. I really get that. 
But because it's sort of all filtered through what you, particularly if you haven't felt things and you haven't um, released certain emotions, then you can't actually get the truth of what's being said into your soul. It will just be through your, your interpretation, if you like. So be open to the possibility that you're just interpreting it, but give it a go, you know, take some action, trial it out. You know, things will be refined via God's laws. That's why God's laws are so wonderful is God's made a structure and a framework that's giving us feedback 24-7 about everything that is out of harmony with love. And it's just trying to correct all the things that are out of harmony with love. And it's trying to help us to see that when you're in harmony with love, life is smoother, better, happier. You know, there's, there's so many good things about living in harmony with God's laws and with love and truth. So the more sensitive we can become, again, an emotional process, you've got to let that air, an emotional experience, I should say. It's not really a process, it's just experiencing emotion. And emotion's not hard, it's just that we've all shut down or we're in denial or, you know, as adults, and we've taught ourselves or we have certain beliefs about emotion. If you work through all of those, emotion actually flows very easily. And emotion's something, it's not like the be all or end all, it's something that happens as you're living life, it really does. If you just live your life, when you have a feeling and feel it, you know, move on, keep living your life, another feeling will come up, experience the feeling, move on, keep going. It's, yeah, lovely, a lovely, it's actually a really lovely experience. When you first start, you may not agree with me. If you stick with it and you're sincere about it, at some point, you will agree with me if you sincerely do it. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, it's good, <laughs> it's good. Um, at some point, I think you will sincerely agree with me, just depending um, on, it just depends how long it takes. But if you resist your emotions, it can become quite painful. And you get quite angry about a lot of stuff. That's what I've uh, found. So to summarise, this presentation was about partner relationships in relationship in relation to parenting, how working things out between partners, so being more truthful, you know, having a desire to love and asking that question, do I want to love, to figure out where you are and measure if you really have a desire or whether you need to actually um, develop one is very important. As the questions to ask in your relationship with your partner about do you want to love and, you know, do you want to, you know, what would love do in these situations and to start, you can start experimenting right now with that, like immediately. In fact, as soon as this video ends, you could start some experiments with that about figuring out, do you really want to love? Because every single thing that happens in a day, you can actually ask the question, wow, you know, do I want to love? And then hold on, what would love do? You know, what would love of myself do? What would love of my partner do? What would my lo partner's love of themselves do? What would my partner's love of me do, you know? They're questions you can revisit again and again and again to find out more and, and you know, figure, figure different things out. So we've covered um, those and they are some helpful tools for more information on relationships and to flesh out those four questions. You can go to the Divine Truth channel, divinetruth.com. We also spoke about relationships and how if partners seek for God's truth or absolute truth on a matter, then a lot of issues get resolved in, in your relationship. Because instead of you being wanting to be right or correct, you're both open to more possibilities and you're both seeking for the actual truth on what's actually happening between you. And you can sort out a lot of different things and break down all the things that are unloving and you know, refine all of those so that you actually start having from a base of love and a foundation of love and truth, then you can build a relationship on that. I haven't done that yet in a partner relationship, but I've definitely done that with friendships. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful thing. I feel very, very grateful for the friendships that I have because they're now based on truth and, um, and a desire to love the other person, desire to get to know the other person. Uh, there's, they're quite different to the experiences I've had in the past. And I have to say I really enjoy, really enjoy it particularly when both parties are um, wanting God's truth on a matter and particularly when both parties want that. So as I've had experiences and friendships with both parties doing that, I know that a partner relationship can do that and I feel very excited about having the opportunity to, to when, you know, when I find my soulmate, 
to actually set that as the foundation of our relationship and move forward in that direction. Also covered in this video, the fact that when, if certain emotional, ne um, you know, wants or needs and or lack of desire to love are in a relationship and they're not resolved in a real way, meaning, in, you know, a soul-based emotional way and are not expressed, you know, not emotionally worked through. There's a tendency, and I don't know, in, in all my observations, I haven't seen it any otherwise, but the children become substitutes for, for the parents, um, for anything they're not getting or perceiving they're not getting in the relationship. And that's very damaging for children. So I've just covered that today because in upcoming presentations we'll talk much more about that. I also discussed how children reflect the relationship that, um, and the dynamics that are happening in the relationship. And this can happen, like the children are going to be reflecting issues that are happening between partners. And it's um, to be humble to what is being shown and reflected back to you by your children is, uh, you know, is very beneficial in a family because children are like barometers. They are indicating where there's issues that are out of harmony with love. They don't necessarily think it through or even analyze that. It's just that they respond and reflect it because they remember that it's a soul to soul relationship and a child is responding to what is in the soul, particularly when they're small and until they start making their own decisions or taking on facades and stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be like that. If a child chose to, they could remain transparent, open and honest and reflect back to you your whole life. But if you're not humble as a parent, you're going to blame the child and make it their problem rather than seeing your part or what's being reflected to you. Those are some examples about you know, children and the way that the dynamics between parents and children play out. There's a lot of information in these videos that I'm presenting and you can take the principles and the main points and you can apply them immediately to your life. The main points in this presentation have been about partner relationships and how that affects, you know, you're in, in a relationship with a partner and how that can affect children and also the, how that reflects back. How you can learn a lot about love and the first place to start is do I want to love? That's like the main um, question which I wanted to introduce today because we'll, we'll come to use that in a lot of different situations throughout the next presentations. And to also decide whether you want to actually love your partner or whether you just want to be loved. Because everyone in the world probably wants to be loved but not a lot of people really desire to truly love others. And that's if you've got children and you're wanting to be loved it's not going to go so well because children are going to reflect <laughs> a lot of things back. And take it from me, I wanted to be loved <laughs> and I didn't get it. And I don't know, like, you know, it depends, I suppose, what you uh, classify as love because a lot of people feel like they're getting their addictions met, emotional or physical addictions met is love. And I've learned that's not true. I also know for certain that if you feel unloved, it doesn't matter how much someone loves you and particularly when people truly love you, when they truly love you, you won't, one, you won't even recognise it and two, you won't be able to like, um, receive the gift of their love because you're so, you have already a, a hurt, injured view of love and you feel like no one loves you. So until you work through all of those feelings within yourself about feeling unloved, until you feel the feelings of feeling unloved, then it's hard to receive love into you because you're already you're kind of addictively wanting to fill in the gaps of feeling unloved, but not necessarily wanting to, uh, yeah, receive the gift of love if that makes sense. As a reminder, the soul is like a container, and so what's if it's if you say it's like a little glass, and if it's already full up, then not much else can get in until you pour something out. So if you pour out some of the feelings that you have, so for this example, if we feel really unloved and we have an emotional feeling of really unloved, on that subject where we feel unloved, we can't receive love until we get rid of some of the pain of feeling unloved. And, you know, you, people can say to you, I love you, I love you, I love you. They can even, like, you know, demonstrate their love. They can have a feeling of love for you. In my experience, you don't feel any of that. You believe that you're unloved until you release and feel through 
the fact of why you feel so unloved, you know, and you actually release that, that in order to create an opening for some love to enter you. And that goes the same for God's love. God wants to give us love. God's love is available at any time if we have a pure desire to receive it. Most of the time we don't receive it because there's something in us, well, there's always something in us blocking it because God always answers a pure desire. So as soon as you have a pure desire, God's love can pour into you and actually can help you to release a lot of unloving feelings that you have in you. But if we're not open to accepting God's love or we don't feel it's possible and we don't have any faith in that, we're not going to want to, you know, we're not going to do it. Like we're, not going to, we're not going to long for God's love and then we're not going to be able to receive it because we don't believe it's possible. Now, the love from a fellow human being as well, you won't be able to receive the love from a fellow human being if you are trying to avoid feeling how unloved you feel. Love's a beautiful healing quality, or, or, and it's also a gift. Having, uh, I know for me in my life, I've felt very unloved a lot in my life. I now have some people in my life who genuinely love me, and what I have found is that their love is Ama is an amazing, amazing gift because it contrasts my own feelings about myself or about things that have happened in my life and brings up a lot of sadness, actually. Like to, to when someone really loves you, it's a lovely uh, feeling, but it often triggers or exposes certain feelings in you, feel for me anyway, feeling unloved. And, you know, I felt quite sad, um, and at times I still do, and I feel like that's like that sometimes with God, when you first ask for God's love, the contrast of like, um, you know, the, f the feelings God has about each of us as, as God's children are very different to pretty much, well, they're incomparable to the feelings that humans have for, for each other. The love of another human is definitely a gift, and it's a beautiful feeling, but I feel like God's, of course, I mean, God's love is far more um, powerful than, than a human's love. And so that, and I, I feel though, if we develop in love, then we, our love as a human can become like expanded and it would be a more powerful feeling as well. I feel like that's possible. But it's, yeah, the gift of love is a very emotional experience, whether from a human or from God, actually. So, yeah, I encourage you to do an experiment and you can, you know, you can ask God to receive some of God's love. You can say, all right, God, if this is real, and if you have a pure desire, you know, pure feeling of like, all right, you know, God, I'd really love to receive some of your love and I've heard it's possible. Could I, could I, you know, have an experience of that? And if you have a pure feeling or a longing for that, God will give you some love and you'll feel, you'll feel what that feels like. God's a good friend and a good parent. You can ask God anything and God will give you an answer if you're open to receiving it. And God wants us to learn and to grow and to develop and be happy. God is very, very good and beautiful and only makes beautiful, wonderful things. So underneath all of the stuff that we put on top of ourselves, you know, that we absorb and we inherit and, you know, all this sort of junk, if you like, that we collect along in our life as we make decisions out of harmony with God's laws and out of harmony with love and truth. You know, we collect all of these things and that causes a lot of pain and suffering. But we can also take all of that off and get rid of all of that stuff as well and come back to what God created, which is beautiful and wonderful. I think each individual's personality and nature, I look forward to seeing those um, be embraced by each, each person um, rather than feeling that they need to modify themselves or be something other than they are. I think it will make us a lot more happy. So that brings me to the end of this presentation and I uh, wish you all the best until I see you next time.